Morning, Glory America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. Hugh Hewitt on the day after the massive spending binge that the Democrats call a COVID relief bill has passed. I want to begin with a quick rundown of the major stories, then come back to what is a certain inflation generator. And when the inflation comes, and inflation is nasty, and many of you don't remember the late 70s and the early 80s, when inflation comes, it will be the Biden inflation. So just write it down. A year ago, actually 14 months ago in January, I was warning everyone every morning about the China virus, the Wuhan plague, what has become known as COVID. And last January, I was urging public tracking of everyone who came in. And I look, no one believed me. President Trump didn't believe me. The Democrats didn't believe me. People listening to the show thought it was out of my mind. But we've got the audio. We've played it for you many, many times on a daily basis. I said, this is bad and it's going to get worse. All right. But it took three months for that to show up. It's going to take actually about a year for the Biden inflation to show up. We are going to have a massive year GDP wise. It's going to be one great year of growth. And then the hangover. The hangover is coming. Oh my gosh, the hangover is coming. Let me run down this third COVID-19 stimulus package, according to the Wall Street Journal, could jolt U.S. growth, revive inflation in 2021. They expect, according to some experts, 6% GDP growth. Some people believe it will be higher than that. Projected that employers will add 514,000 jobs a quarter over the next uh, uh, jobs a month and the, the next year. So we're going to have a great year. It's going to be like having every credit card you have max out and live high. And then the bill comes due. You can't increase the national debt of the United States accumulated since 1789 by 10% in three months, eight weeks, actually. And not there's a reason we haven't done this before. That reason is called economics. The massive amount of money. Look, this is a blue state bailout. Every government employee is clicking their heels everywhere in the United States. Nobody's going to get laid off. No belts are going to be tightened. No taxes are going to be cut. They actually forbade tax cuts. Mitch McConnell was asked about it at a press conference yesterday. It's the single key quote on that. Let's play cut number four. The president will soon be signing the $1.9 trillion stimulus bill. I think the most distinct features are the following. Number one, it solved New York's budget problem. So finally, some good news for Governor Cuomo. Uh, Senator Schumer has solved his financial issues. Uh, they've also, by the way, solved the financial problems of San Francisco. They've also prevented state governments from lowering taxes. This is a classic example of big government democratic overreach in the name of COVID relief. And we all know that what we should have been doing and would have been done had this been a bipartisan discussion instead of a jam the other side approach is five or six hundred billion dollars directly targeted at the problem but of course the 1.9 trillion dollar problem as we said repeatedly the 1.9 trillion dollar package as we said repeatedly only had about one percent or less for vaccines nine percent or less for health care so I think this is actually one of the worst pieces of legislation I've seen pass here in the time I've been in the Senate. Now he's right. And the Biden inflation is coming. The lead story over at CNN pre-market, the world went on a debt binge last year. There could be a nasty hangover. It's going to be called inflation. Meanwhile, confidence of U.S. executives soars. The business roundtable says everybody's optimistic. I am. I'm so glad I own real estate. I'm so glad I have money in the stock market and not in bonds. I'm so glad I don't have cash because cash is dumb right now because inflation is going to, to take it away from you. But all the employers out there say it's going to be a great year. What does the COVID-19 stimulus bill mean for loan forgiveness, financial aid, and college students? The Wall Street Journal says a lot. A lot of students are going to get partial loan forgiveness. A lot of students are going to get new financial aid, go deeper into the hole. Colleges that are inefficient and teach basket weaving are going to get a big bailout. Colleges like Hillsdale that don't take any federal aid is going to get nothing. States expected COVID-19 to bring widespread tax shortfalls. It didn't happen. I love this article in the Wall Street Journal. There aren't massive state tax falls. 
There have been massive destruction of small businesses, but the COVID bill does nothing for them. Then there is the Wall Street Journal headline. I love this one the most, the progressive Democrat steamroller. The 1.9 trillion spending bill is only a taste of what's coming. Not true. Joe Manchin again yesterday said he is not going to be uh, supporting, not going to support at all any filibuster changes. So they get one more bill. They get another reconciliation bill in which they will raise taxes and spend money on infrastructure. It will be another spending binge. Democrats spend money and they do it in ways that are irresponsible and we're going to get crushed. There is a great analysis in the Washington Post, how the $1.9 trillion U.S. stimulus package compares with other countries' coronavirus spending. Understand that the $1.9 comes on top of $4 trillion. We spent $6 trillion in one year, $6 trillion. That's six years of deficit in six months. It is so much more than the rest of the world has spent. We may have spent more on ourselves than the world spent everywhere else. In Japan, they had a $707 billion stimulus bill on top of two previous packages that amounted to $2.2 trillion. So they spent about, not, about $3 trillion. We spent about $6 trillion. So we spent twice as much as Japan. All right, twice as much. It's all borrowed money. Now, let me give you some good news. Israeli scientists discovered that aspirin may protect against COVID-19. People who take small doses are 29% less likely to test positive. That's in the Times of Israel. We also find an enormous, an enormous uh, border crisis. The facing pressure, Biden administration scrambles to shelter migrant children. And we've got Jen Psaki mixing it up with Peter Ducey yesterday. Cut number six. You mentioned okay. those CDC guidelines. Does the White House think it's a problem that when the CDC tells these migrant shelter facilities, that they can be at full capacity if they are careful about COVID. Many of them do. But when the CDC tells schools that they can open in person at full capacity, many of them don't. Are, is there a school in particular that you have as an example that didn't do that? Are most schools in this country at full capacity with in-person learning? Uh, are, are there a specific school, though, that is not following the CDC guidelines of, of implementing the mitigation steps so they can reopen? I mean, the CDC is saying schools, you can be at, at every school can be at full capacity. With the, the, know, CDC guideline, the CDC yeah. guidelines, just to be clear, because I think this is very important to be very clear and specific on, they, they gave eight mitigation steps that schools can take to safely reopen. A number of schools have actually recently reopened. Schools in uh, Washington, D.C., some have. Schools in many districts across the country. But each school district needs to make the decision about whether they are able to take those mitigation steps. The president has also been clear. Some of these school districts need additional funding. There's $160 billion in this package that he's going to sign into law later this week. The Secretary of Education will be quite focused on working with school districts to help them reopen. But more school districts are reopening. More kids are in classrooms every single day. But since they are not all back from an administration position or from your perspective, have the Border Patrol unions and the HHS unions been easier to work with than the teachers unions? Uh I, I think that's a, a little bit of mixing different circumstances. Uh, I would say that uh, it's, it's children all in tight quarters. Uh, uh, I mean, a classroom. <laughs> Not quite. Not, funny. Uh, uh, not quite. I, I would say that let, let's let's take a responsible approach to the two issues. Okay, one is schools reopening. There's been eight mitigation steps that have been announced by the CDC to implement. Right. Yeah. Every school district is going to work to implement those on a timeline that is uh, they can effectively do. Many school districts are reopening, right? Many are reopening every single week and day and week, right? That is a different circumstance than what we are seeing at the border. And the HHS oversees the, these facilities, right? They're working with, uh, they're working on ensuring we can have more kids safely. They are working to implement CDC guidelines, but. They are different circumstances, and certainly we're working with the school districts, and we're also working with HHS to open these facilities or to ensure that kids are treated uh, with safety and care in these facilities. This is nonsense. In fact, they are jamming them into the same cells that uh, the Trump administration used. Meanwhile, schools are closed across the United States. You know if your child is working from your kitchen counter. You know that. So Jen Psaki is just not telling you the truth. Just remember that. 
Just remember that. More on the rundown coming up. Don't go anywhere, America. It's the Hugh Hewitt Thursday edition of the Hugh Hewitt Show. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you by Food for the Poor. This is Carol platt Lebow of YankeeInstituteForTownHall.com. Matt Meyer is president of the Berkeley Federation of Teachers, a union leading the effort to keep children at home, insisting that reopening schools is just too unsafe. So Jaws dropped when video of him was seen taking his own daughter to in-person preschool. The episode highlights the hypocrisy and cynicism evident in too much COVID policy, especially in education. School districts with strong teachers' unions are less likely to hold in-person classes. Meanwhile, our children remain trapped at home, suffering from social isolation and learning loss. The achievement gap has increased, and there is a worsening youth mental health crisis. Parents have stood by helplessly at the mercy of the unions, even as the CDC admits that schools can reopen safely. In-person learning shouldn't be reserved for children of the privileged. Our kids deserve policies that put their rightful needs over the self-serving demands of union elites. I'm Carol platt Lebow. The Pepperdine Graduate School of Public Policy, impacting policy decisions today, preparing public leaders for tomorrow. Learn more at publicpolicy.pepperdine. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Gorka. Disney Plus pulls iconic movies Dumbo, The Aristocats, and Peter Pan because they're racist. Now, I do believe it's 2021. Why were they not racist for the last 60 years, 70 years? How do they suddenly become racist today? The answer to that question is really to be found in everything we have discussed on this show for nigh on 26 months since we launched America First. If you think what you're witnessing today is the result of some crazy bartender from New York being elected to Congress or because Joe Biden is senile and can't answer any questions, has been hiding for eight weeks in the White House, no, it is a much, much larger story. Decades in the preparation, from our teacher training colleges, to the media, to film directors, filmmakers in Hollywood, to those who have crafted a narrative that everything that defines our civilization is to use their terminology, quote, problematic. Anything that dismantles concepts of objective truth is good. In fact, anybody who speaks of truth is oppressing somebody else. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Charlie Kirk show. I kind of am obligated to get into this story right now, which is the story of Meghan Markle and Prince Harry. So I want to read this tweet here from Ben Means, an expert on the British monarchy. A lot of respect for the tradition and all of that. A lot of great friends in London and Great Britain. It's just not a primary concern of mine. And so I want to read from Ben Goldsmith's tweet, which I thought was terrific. The narrative being promoted by Meghan, friends of Meghan, and the leftist mainstream media and everyone else who hates the royal family and British traditions generally is that the royal couple were driven out of Britain because of snobbery and racism. This just isn't true. The British tabloid press and the British publicly initially adored the idea that a glamorous star from Suits was marrying into the royal family and got terribly excited by the novelty of their royal wedding in the chapel of Windsor Castle. 
they only started going off Megan when they realized she was a pushy. Welcome back, America. Chew Hewitt. This segment on the passage of the massive $2 trillion bill is brought to you by Birch Gold. I want to, uh, I want to make sure that we cover uh, a story on CNN, which says simply, desperate to save their economies from complete collapse, governments borrowed unprecedented amounts of money on the cheap to support workers and businesses during the pandemic. Now, with recovery in sight, a big risk looms interest payments. That's what happens when inflation comes. All that national debt, which we're paying 2 3% on, has to be refinanced all around the world. And it will be refinanced at new interest rates. So let's take a look and see what is going on in the debt markets as a result of this. And this is brought to you again by Birch Gold. If you're going to buy gold, and it's not a bad bet right now to get diversified, get 10% into precious metals, a lot into real estate, be fully invested, cash is going to decline in value because we printed a lot more cash around the world. I mean, that, that, that's a boatload of dough around the world. Um, gold this morning is at $1,733.40. That is up about three quarters of a percent from yesterday, two thirds of a percent. The 10-year treasury fell a little bit to 1.52%. It panicked earlier. They realized that the money hadn't gone out yet. It'll go out and will spread around. And then the economy reopens as it was going to do anyway. The vaccines roll out and people go back to normal. All that money gets spent and goes up. Gold will go up, I think. And I think you ought to get a diversified, in, a diversified portfolio of assets right now. If you've got any money saved and you leave it in cash, you put it in a CD, you're asking to get screwed. I'm not a financial advisor. I don't tell you what to do. I know that diversification usually works and gold is a part of that diversification makes sense. That's why I buy gold from Birch Gold and you can find out all you need to know about it by sending a text or sending my name, Hugh, H-U-G-H, to 474747. Just text Hugh to 474747 or visit hughgold.com. Yesterday, the Dow went up 464 points. We're back in record territory. The NASDAQ slipped four points as it watched all the money go into the Dow. And the S&P was up 23. Overseas this morning, the Hong Kong index is up 1.5% because China and U.S. economy have not decoupled. They're still tied together. And Blinken is going off to meet, Secretary of State Blinken is going off to meet with the Chinese in Anchorage before heading, after heading to Japan and South Korea. Uh, so we're going to recouple that amount that's already been uncoupled. And so China's got great growth. They're expecting 6% to 8% growth in the United States for one year. It's going to be great for one year. It's going to be terrific for one year. In 2022, the bill will come due. And so it's just like maxing out your credit card. It is. So imagine you had a giant mortgage on the house and you were house poor. Imagine that, being house poor. And then all of a sudden you got a bunch of money and you didn't pay down your debt. Instead, you spent all that money on credit card. At the end of the year, you not only are house poor, but you have a credit card debt. That's the United States. Now, not all of the bill is bad. Not all of it is bad. I, I think probably 20% of it is what would have happened had the Republicans won one of the two Senate races in Georgia. About 20%. We got about another $200 billion targeted, maybe an unemployment relief. Maybe they would have done the child tax credit. That's an interesting policy experiment. It's the best part of the bill. It's a one-year experiment. We'll see how it works. Maybe it's worth renewing. Maybe it's worth a bipartisan effort to extend. But it's, a, it's just profligate. So Democrats have gone and spent all your money on their Democrat friends, public employee unions, the city of San Francisco, the state of New York. Mitch McConnell is 100% correct. They bailed out the blue states. They did so at the expense of the red states. The aid was not done on a per capita basis. It wasn't done on an equal basis. It was not spread across the United States. It went to blue states disproportionately. Nobody can argue that. Why? Because the blue states, look, never let a crisis go to waste. Rahm Emanuel, never let a crisis go to waste. 
So it passed without any Republican votes for a reason. It's a bad fiscal policy. If you could just spend $2 trillion, why didn't we do it before? Because there's a hangover coming. We drank a fifth yesterday in an hour. And it's not going to be good for you. Stay tuned, America. It's the Hugh Hewitt Show. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you in part by Birch Gold Group. Trending now on the Mike Gallagher Show. For all of the hysteria of Trump haters for four years, ranting and raving about, you know, mean Donald Trump and he's unconventional and he's not presidential. And do you think anybody worried about his mental competency? They didn't, you know. And yet about half the nation is worried that Joe Biden is physically and mentally not up to the job. Did you hear about the Rasmussen Reports survey that came out this week? 50% of Americans in the Rasmussen poll say they're not confident that Joe Biden is physically and mentally up to the job of being president of the United States. I just want to thank you both, and I want to thank the the, the uh, former general, I keep calling him general, but my my uh the guy who runs that outfit over there uh i want to make sure we thank the secretary for all he's done to try to implement what we've just talked about and for recommending these two women for promotion 34 percent only 34 percent of the rasmussen poll survey 34 percent are very confident that he's up to the job <laughs> only 30 so, you know, a third of Americans are very confident he's up to the job. Half say he's not he's not physically and mentally up to it. 52% of likely voters are concerned that he hasn't held a press conference. He hasn't had a press conference yet. He has not had a solo press conference yet. You know why? Well, you know why. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. This is Carol platt Lebow of Yankee Institute for townhall.com. Matt Meyer is president of the Berkeley Federation of Teachers, a union leading the effort to keep children at home, insisting that reopening schools is just too unsafe. So jaws dropped when video of him was seen taking his own daughter to in-person preschool. The episode highlights the hypocrisy and cynicism evident in too much COVID policy, especially in education. School districts with strong teachers unions are less likely to hold in-person classes. Meanwhile, our children remain trapped at home, suffering from social isolation and learning loss. The achievement gap has increased, and there's a worsening youth mental health crisis. Parents have stood by helplessly at the mercy of the unions, even as the CDC admits that schools can reopen safely. In-person learning shouldn't be reserved for children of the privileged. Our kids deserve policies that put their rightful needs over the self-serving demands of union elites. I'm Carol platt Lebow. The Pepperdine Graduate School of Public Policy, impacting policy decisions today, preparing public leaders for tomorrow. Learn more at publicpolicy.pepperdine. Trending now on the Dennis Prager Show. John, uh, we were talking about uh, HR1, which is government takeover of state elections and how it's skewed to, to keep the... Uh, Democrats in power. But while I have you, I feel like a guy who's ordering a second dessert. I would like to get a, a brief take on the $2 trillion bailout. Well, that may be the second worst piece of legislation <laughs> I have seen in the last 40 years. I really uh, think. Think about this. How many people do you know who have lost their jobs or at hours cut back and are struggling with their um, paying their bills? I bet you and I both know a lot. Of right? course, yes. Did you know that government workers, who, by the way, even if they've been working from home, um, haven't 
you know, or at reduced hours, haven't suffered any cutback in pay. Did you know that this bill includes a twenty thousand dollar leave benefit because they've been on leave at home for federal workers? No, I did not know that. Twenty thousand dollars. Now, private sector workers aren't eligible for that. Right. Just That's government it. workers Th- for the it, pay. It, this is the seal of the corruption. The ba- I'll tell you what gets me. The bailing out of Democratic uh, governors and mayors of the gigantic, irresponsible debts that they have created, and now they will be paid in paper money manufactured by the government. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Larry Elder Show. We're talking about the Welcome back, America. Chew Hewitt. As everyone knows, I begin my show prep each night before the show by reading the Times of Israel, because they're furthest ahead of us. And I read today, Israel's ambassador in New Zealand casts the first vote of the election. So the Israeli elections are underway, and now's the time to bring in Dr. Michael Oren, former Israeli ambassador to the United States, former deputy minister in the government, now a remarkable author and expert on all things, everything. Michael, good morning. Thank you for spending extra time with us today. I really want the American audience to understand what is going on, but that actually begins with the rules. Uh, how are you this morning? I'm fine, Hugh. Good to be with you as always. Um, good that they're voting in New Zealand, but uh, nobody here seems to much know that their election's going on. Very, very low key. Well, uh, we have some good news. That IDF declared we're the first military in the world with herd immunity. However, Benjamin Netanyahu had to cancel his trip to the United Arab Emirates because his wife is ill and there's a dispute over Jordanian access to the Temple Mount. All that is in the background. Tell us when Israel votes, and if you can, a primer, because we're going to post this in a podcast as well, a primer on how Israel votes and the makeup of the parties in the Channel 12 poll. Whoa. Okay. I know, it's a lot. It's a lot. All right, so we're going, to, we're going to the polls in about uh, this is far less than two weeks now, and um, you, 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 it's low tech. You go, you, you go into a booth, you, you, you pick out a slip of paper that has the party you want to vote for, you put it in an envelope, you take the envelope out of the booth, and you put it in a box. Which is, it turns out, you know, in the world of, uh, of hacking computers, uh, it, it's a pretty good way to vote. And there are more countries in the world, democratic countries, that are thinking about going back to our system rather than to going to a, a more computerized system. Do you have to uh, show ID, Ambassador Oren? Do you have to prove that you're Michael Oren when you vote? Of course, of course. You come in. Well, that's not true ID. in the United States. You know, you can just show up and say, I'm Hugh Hewitt. And if my name's on the rolls, they let you in. That's amazing. But it's true. But it's I, I true. Didn't know that. <laughs> oh, in California. <laughs> How do you do that? Do you know that in California, where I lived for five years, I've, I've been gone for five years, we still get two ballots sent for the fetching Mrs. Hewitt and I to our old address every single election. We get two ballots. That's uh, very curious indeed. Very curious. Now, here you stand in line, you go, you show your ID, they check you off on your day, you go to a certain polling station, um, there's no mail ins, uh, no, there are provisions for diplomats serving abroad and for military missions, but that's about it. Uh, no absentee ballots other than that. And there was concern because of because of Corona whether we'd actually be able to go to a ballot box this year. Um, that concern has now been removed because uh, we are approaching herd immunity as a, as a society, not just in the army. So we're we're walking up to what is, and again, you're going to have to explain. I'm I'm going to post this as a separate. I, this is the fourth time Israel has voted in two years. I'm unaware of a precedent in a democratic country for this. Indeed, and it's not it's not a uh, it's not a record we're proud of. To tell you the truth, I tell you we 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 surpassed the Italians some time ago. 
Um, that you see, it, it doesn't, I think, uh, generate a tremendous amount of respect for the Israeli political system among Israelis themselves. As I said before, people are tired. People have election fatigue here. Uh, there are almost no elected posters around, no uh, commercials. The commercials are always a source of entertainment. All of our, com- our political commercials are reserved to, are confined to one hour of TV on public television uh, each night. And usually nobody watches them, but this year there's not even any, there's not even any advertisements on TV. Now, I remember um, when Bibi did the camper video. I love that with the two people that were lost in the wilderness and they ran into Bibi with a backpack. Nothing like that this time. No memorable ads. Nothing. And, and, and the greatest, the greatest political cartoon of all time, we have advertised all time, was like a thirty cent spot that had Bibi as the babysitter. It was called the Bibi Sitter, <laughs> where uh, a couple's going out for dinner and he's at the door. And they said, we didn't ask for you. I said, well, I'll go get your Lapid. I'll go get this guy. And the couple goes, no, 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 you come in. And then you cut to the end, and the parents are coming in, and BBC eating popcorn uh, and watching TV. And the parents say, how are our kids? And BB says, your kids are safe. And that's it. That's the babysitter, which pretty much sums up 20 years of Israeli politics, uh, which uh, prime minister is going to keep us, our kids, safest at night. That's it. That's all about Israeli politics you have to know. Well, uh, well, in that yeah. background, the, the threat is growing. Iran is using super-duper centrifuges now. They've clearly broken out of uranium enrichment. They're clearly now abetted by the Biden administration. I think they will be. But security is not an issue? Security is less of an issue right now. We haven't had, you know, terrorism in a long time. Uh, the big issues today are, you know, handling the corona crisis, whether it was well-handled or not well-handled. Uh, Making you know, leading the, co- the economy to uh, a recovery, um, and just BB fatigue as well. Um, there's a man who holds the records now by far as Israel's longest-serving uh, prime minister. Yes, he is facing three uh, corruption charges in court, and he'll have to appear in court eventually um, every week. Um, and really, there's a coalition. It's not even between right and left anymore. It's between anti-BB, pro-BB. With the anti-BD camp divided between people on the right, people on the extreme left, and the big issue is whether they will get collectively enough votes and whether they'll be able to sit together in one government, even though they will not have ideological conformity in any way, will they be able to sit in that government long enough to take down BD Netanyahu? Nobody's done it so far. You ask me, they're not going to do it this time either. Well, the interesting part about Israeli politics, it took me a, a while to grasp, is if you can't unseat the sitting prime minister, the sitting prime minister continues to sit. So they, the, the real deal is the anti bb coalition has to get to 61 votes, right? Yep, they do. And to do that, will they need the, quote, Arab list, the joint list? Can you explain what that is? and how it figures in, in Israeli policy. There are 120 seats in the Knesset. You need 61 to govern. You can form a government. You got to get to 61. Can the left and the anti bbites get to 61 without the Arab joint list? Well, the, theoretically, you could get less. You could get 58. But if the Arab joint list supports the 58 from outside of the government and votes with that block, then you'll get well past 61. Because in the previous round, the, the Arab list was the third largest party in Knesset uh, with 14 seats. Now, it, it's gone down, and it's also been divided between a faction which is uh, actually in favor of sitting with Netanyahu. It's a faction that is actually more Islamic in its outlook. Uh, and the nationalists uh, are against Netanyahu. But in either case, there was a poll published last night that says that Jewish Israelis are overwhelmingly opposed to any government that cooperates with the Arab list because it is a a seemingly profoundly anti-Zionist list. And in the case of the nationalists, these are people who have supported terror again and again and again. Uh, as a member of Knesset, I supported evicting some of them, uh, uh, using the U.S. Constitution as my model, or the eviction clause, so the expulsion clause. So um, it, it is very, very controversial, but that's the, that's the reality. Um, and whether it's going to be Netanyahu or the opposition to Netanyahu, at some point, the Arab lists are going to figure in the equation. All right. Now, uh, for the benefit of newbies, can you start on the left and move to the right of the parties minus their BB uh, inclination pro or con? Just if they were generally left wing socialist over the way to right wing separationist and ultra orthodox, how do they roll? OK, so <laughs> take a deep breath. We'll start with merits on the left. Merits is 
not a, a Zionist party. It is a, not an anti-Zionist party. The head of that party, uh, Horowitz, recently came out uh, in support of the ICC investigation of Israel for war crimes. Oh. That's pretty far on the left. <laughs> it's not certain that it'll actually make it into Knesset. You have, to, you have to get a certain percentage of the votes, a minimal percentage, percentage of the votes in order to get into Knesset. It's not certain that they're going to pass that, uh, that bar. A um, little bit more center way, but still quite on the left, is the Labour Party, which has, um, has fallen on very, very hard times. It was the party that created the State of Israel, which ruled the State of Israel from 1948 to 1977, when uh, Menachem Begit defeated uh, Yitzhak Rabin. That party now has had a bit of a revival under Merav Mikhaeli, uh, a, a woman, a, a radical feminist, uh, a friend, um, and they're expected to get about seven seats, which is uh, something of a revival uh, from Labor, because in previous rounds, Labor just barely made it into Knesset. Um, moving toward uh, the center, the Yesh Atid party. There is a future party of Yair Lapid. It, it fashions itself as a center-center-right party. Um, parts of that party are center-center-left, and it's doing quite well. Is he the mayor of Tel Aviv? Yeah, he didn't. Uh, he didn't make it in. Okay. Ron okay. was 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 going to be the sort of the hope of of the left, and he he fizzled out very very fast. He didn't even get on a the list mayor, for labor, uh, or he didn't get on anybody's he list. Huh. Okay. He was going to take over labor. He had his own party. It was going to just unite with labor. It didn't quite work out. He was not. A, he didn't succeed as a national politician. He's a, he's a good mayor. Um, moving now, so Yer Lapid has been in Knesset, established this party. Back in 2013, he succeeded in keeping this party in Knesset, which is no small uh, feat. And, um, and many people, many people, including very good friends of mine, are, are supportive of him. They see him as a, as a politician who has grown. He was a TV uh, interviewer, and he's grown into something of a national figure, a bit of a statesman, a good politician, uh, a very formidable uh, opposition to, 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 uh, to Netanyahu, and a very comfortable opponent for Netanyahu. Because How Netanyahu old is he? How does he have a good defense profile towards Iran? Oh yes, there's nobody here, with the exception of you know parts of the left and the radical left who support the JCPOA. Okay. Um, there are several members of Knesset, two members of Knesset from the left who support the JCPOA, uh, but they are you know small, small time compared to. There was a group of 20 uh, former high-ranking officers uh, and Mossad officials who came out in support of the JCPOA. The next day, another group. Uh, came out against the JCPOA, 1,800 uh, former high-ranking officers. So that gives you a sense of the proportion of, of Israelis who support it and those of Israelis who are against it. Um, but I was saying that the European is a very comfortable opponent to Netanyahu because he's not from the right. So he can attack, uh, he can attack the European as a leftist. He cannot do that with the next party, which is Yamina, the rightward party um, of Naftali Bennett which is a right-wing party with some very right-wing uh, people in it, Natalie Bennett, um, the son of uh, Americans and Canadians, speaks English, uh, has been in the, the Israeli political scene now for many years, and he's viewed as the sort of the, the swing vote, that no government can come into being without Natalie Bennett's Yamina party. So he has, even though he's only expected to get between 11, 12, at most 14 seats, he could actually end up being prime minister in the rotational situation because he, he, is, the, he is the only person, the only party that's willing to sit both in Netanyahu and against Netanyahu. Get that one. Moving further, now to the right, uh, is uh, the New Hope Party of Gidon Saar, and um, a right-wing party, but he, Gidon Saar um, is a, a, a formidable enemy and opponent of, of Netanyahu, and he has said he will never sit with Netanyahu. So, uh, in a way that... Well, didn't Benny Gantz say forward. that, too? Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, so I, I, I'm curious, by the right, way, I have to give a cue okay. to Adam. We're going to rejoin the show in progress and go long so that we can post this all as a primer for everyone. Uh, we're going to go okay. live, so just take us in live. So New Hope SAR, uh, they are right wing. They are pro-IDF. Everybody is that we're into now, but they're anti-BB, right? Anti-BB. Okay, uh, next. The Kansas Party, Blue and White, is still running. It is uh, center, maybe center right. Um, it may not pass the uh, the bar to get into Knesset, um, and then there there is the uh, Bet Lieberman, I think the Lieberman's party, and uh, it's a largely Russian uh, party. Israel is our home party. It is right wing, 
and anti-Orthodox, the Orthodox Jewish, is against the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox Jews, um, and won't sit with them in the same uh, coalition. Um, Ibn Galibin has always chosen an, an enemy. In the past, he was against the Arabs. Now he's against the ultra-Orthodox. But it gives him a lot of power because there's a tremendous amount of resentment against the um, ultra-Orthodox here for their flouting of government restrictions on the corona crisis. Now, Avador uh, Lieberman actually precip uh, precipitated this entire two-year cycle, right? He was expected to sit with Netanyahu in the first of the four elections on which we are on the fourth, and he refused to at the last minute. Am I right in recollecting that, uh, Michael? Yes, you are. And, you know, there were other factors that contributed, but he was certainly essential. And it's interesting that both Avigdor Lieberman, uh, Gideon Saar, uh, Natalie Bennett, these are, these are all people who work for Netanyahu, and now they're committed to taking him down. Um, at least in word, if not in deed. And um, it says a lot about uh, Netanyahu's interpersonal relationships, certainly, um, and, uh, but also his, uh, his formidable ability to just keep on coming back. It's always premature to eulogize him politically. And after that, we come to Likud, right? And then there's Likud. Then there's Likud, there's Netanyahu's own party, uh, which is polling about 27 seats, still the largest party in Knesset, Netanyahu is still viewed by the majority of Israelis as the individual most qualified to be prime minister. Even Israelis who don't like him understand he's most qualified to be prime minister. And, um, and the, the question is whether, again, whether the Likud and Netanyahu can pull together the 61, or whether these other parties who are against Netanyahu can pull together the 61, in either case with the support of at least one Arab faction from outside. Now, to the right of Likud, and some people say Bennett's party is to the right of Likud, but let's ignore that. They're interchangeable in, in an American's point of view, a secular American's point of view. Now we come into the religious parties, correct? All right, so not done yet. So then there were religious parties who are national religious, who believe in the state of Israel. That would be also, you mean, and there, there are two parties there. Um, one of uh, Betzal el uh, a young uh, settlement leader, um, very formidable individual, very smart, very dynamic. And then there's Otsmai Yudhi, Jewish Power, which is a descendant from America Hanna's uh, racist fascist party, uh, which had been kept out of Knesset uh, originally by a high court order because of this. It's now back in a different iteration and is openly allied with the pro Netanyahu faction, uh, which is highly, highly controversial for this country. Has it evolved away from its fascist roots in Kahanism? Mm, it's debatable. Um, for example, they are uh, they venerate uh, um, who conducted who, who perpetrated a massacre against Palestinians in the in the tomb of the patriarchs in Hebron oh. and um, Goldberg and uh, you know they, they're they, it's highly what can I say it, are there any potential allies of for us. are there any allies of Netanyahu who will not sit in a government with them? No. Okay. So that as a as a political matter. It's possibly a piece of the Netanyahu puzzle. Yes, not possibly, All right. probably. All right. Okay, then, then you come to the ultra-Orthodox parties, which are the Ashkenazi, the European, Eastern European uh, ultra-Orthodox parties, the Mizrahi Sephardi parties, known as, um, uh, whereas uh, the, all, the Ashkenazi ultra-Orthodox parties have already said they're going to be on the side uh, of Netanyahu, as have the, the Mizrahi parties. Uh, under Arya Derry, who's a longtime uh, ally of Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, also, there are parties like the Lieberman's party, but also uh, Yerba Peace party, so they, they simply won't sit in the government with these ultra-Orthodox parties. So that becomes an issue as well. So so when we, when we break this down, ideologically, as you've mm -hmm. said many times, Israel has moved steadily right in its maturation as a state beginning in 1948. It is now a conservative society and it supports generally center right and right and religious parties. And that mm -hmm. trend is continuing, right? They get a larger share of the yes. vote every time? Yes, they do. And we have the, the largest youth population in the world and unlike youth populations elsewhere in the world, in Europe and the United States, our youth is right wing. The youth is right because they've, been, they've lived through the Intifada, they've lived through terrorist attacks, uh, they don't believe that if you give the, the Palestinians a piece of territory, they're going to make peace with us. So that's basically, people are skeptical. Young people now, are skeptical, and I think legitimately skeptical. I've got to ask, at what point does a movement arise, oh, just let Netanyahu do it. Someday he'll die. You know, it, when, when does that become <laughs> the... I, I, 
it's going to happen, and, uh, and it's very robust and very healthy. So he's really, he might go another 10 years unless he's dislodged. Ooh, you know, Adenauer was, uh, was the leader of Germany into his 90s. <laughs> that be a long time. But it's democratic, though. I don't want anyone to understand. It, it, no, I, I mean, it's just the Israelis trust Bibi. And is there a, um, is there a, a libertarian Israel that votes for him because he stays out of their way? Is there, is there that kind of party? In, in Israel? There was a libertarian party that ran two elections ago and didn't make it into Knesset. Okay, now can you explain the 3.5% rule and why in the world that's part of the Israeli constitution? Because if you get 3.5% of the vote, you get five seats in Knesset. If you get less than that, you get no seats in Knesset. And they're always fiddling with that number. And the last time anybody fiddled with that number was Yvette Lieberman, who raised it, and by raising it, he actually caused all the Arab parties to unite into the United Arab List, uh, which proved to greatly augment, you know, the anti-Zionist Arab power in Knesset. Okay, so now if an American audience is listening, the idea of having four presidential elections in two years would be exhausting. Do you raise money? Do, do people have to go out and get done again and again and again from the from the wealthy people and the mi middle class and the upper middle class or small donors? Is it an exhausting financial proposition for individuals to support election after election? In fact, in fact, no. Israel has very strict campaign financing rules. We are restricted to a donation of $2,600 per family, not per individual here. Her family, and there are no super facts. And in fact, the Knesset, the government, provides the funds for each each party to campaign. And whether fair or not fair, the bigger the party, the bigger the funds that gets the campaign. So there's a tremendous advantage to existing large parties over small and new parties. Um, but in fact, we have no almost no campaign financing difficulties in this country. It's one of the few aspects of Israeli democracy I think that uh, America could benefit from. Well, that's unconstitutional here, according to Citizens United, but we'll come back to that another time. Let's, let's begin to land this plane, uh, Michael Oren. We've got the fourth election in two years coming up, and in Great Britain and in other places, we get surprises sometimes. I believe there have been a few surprises in Israel over the years as well. Do you think there's a potential for a surprise, either pro or anti BB, at this point? You know, most of the most of the commentators and analysts you talk to think that BB's going to lose. They think that the anti BB groups, the factions, can get together even for a short period of time and oust him. And once he's ousted, then he must appear in court, not as Prime Minister Netanyahu, but as citizen Netanyahu, and he will not be able to run again once he is out. Uh, they believe they can do that. I remain skeptical. Even in the face of mounting numbers against Netanyahu, um, I still believe, particularly after he has made Israel the first country in the world to be almost completely vaccinated, uh, since he has led us to the coronavirus uh, crisis, I think there's a good chance he's going to win again. Well, do Israelis or, connect... Or, or at, the, at the very most, we'll go to a, we'll go to a fifth round of elections. Uh, this is the thing I don't get. Um... Usually Americans vote yes or no based upon how they feel economically and how they feel about the future. And Israel's had a very good run uh, in terms of building the wall, bringing security back after a plague of terrorism, uh, staring down Iran, taking out Iranian targets in Syria. And the economy is, is a thing of wonder when there isn't a coronavirus shutdown. And now it's the first. How can I really genuinely am perplexed how this is even close? I think it'd be close to mean against Netanyahu or for Yeah, Netanyahu. against Netanyahu. I mean, if you look at this, unless you're bored with him, the, the country works maybe better than any country on the planet. I mean, how's your poverty level? There's significant poverty. You'd be surprised. We have the third largest income gap in the world after the United States, Chile, and Mexico. Uh, many people believe the poverty level here. Uh, almost two different economies. You have the high-tech economy, Tel Aviv, the center. Uh, but you have the periphery where many, many people are poor. So, do, you know, do the poor people get medical the care? Is, the fear is that Bibi is going to put together a government made of ultra-Orthodox and extreme rightist, even fascist and racist, which will change the fundamental character of the country. 
and uh, make us less democratic. And that's the fear here. Um, and the fear of you know, electing a, a prime minister who has served too long, a uh, fear of a prime minister who is facing these corruption tri- tri- charges. Um, there are fears, and those fears are moting a number of, of voters, including some former BB supporters, to vote against him. Now, the last couple of questions. He always, I, I follow Israeli elections for years, he always pulls out something new in the end. There's always a twist. Uh, one day it's the Arabs are going to win. The other day it's Iran is a threat. The you know, other time it's funny. What's he doing? What's his strategy this time? Well, his strategy was to go to, to the UAE today, and that got canceled. He was supposed to meet with MBS, too, the, uh, the Saudi crown prince. Uh, that got canceled because of the uh, an appendix infection of, infection of his wife and also because of a, a controversy with Jordan over a, a proposed visit of King Abdullah to Temple Mount. And whether we whether Israeli forces would let his security forces, his security personnel onto the Temple Mount, uh, it's a long story. It's another story. it's another program that explain that whole thing, Jordan's uh, Jordan's status on the Temple Mount and the controversies around it. So this chip didn't pull out. He, he wanted a photo op. He wanted a photo op as the you know, sort of doing a victory lap for the Abraham Accords, uh, holding up the possibility of relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia, and saying, "Listen, I'm the guy who did this, and I'm the guy who can do this in the in the future." None of these other people have something, even a fragment of my diplomatic and strategic uh, experience. Uh, you want to have peace with the Arab world? I'm the guy you vote for. So that, that is a good appeal. The anti-Netanyahu appeal is we can do the same thing without Bibi. Is that it? That's it. And that, that uh, UAE and Bahrain and Sudan and Morocco made peace with Israel, not because of Bibi, but because Israel is strong. And as the United States continues to withdraw uh, from the Middle East and perhaps reconcile with Iran once again and renew the JCPOA, we're going to need Israel. Uh, Israel is, doesn't threaten us the way Turkey does, the way Russia does. Uh, Israel is not an enemy. Israel is our ally. And it has nothing to do with Bibi. It has to do with Israel itself. Well, that's where, you know, the calculation, and you've told me many, many times, Israeli voters don't much concern themselves with national security issues abroad when it comes down to it. Americans on the center right are very comfortable with Netanyahu, and even on the center left, they mostly shut up about him. If they don't like him on the far left, they hate Netanyahu. That doesn't matter at all because they just assume American military aid and financial aid and the close security relationship will continue regardless of who's prime minister. Is that a correct characterization? That's a correct characterization. There was a poll taken some years ago, I remember, that it said if Netanyahu ran uh, in the United States for president, he would easily win the nomination for the Republican Party. (laughs) <laughs> this poll. You know, uh, I, I think that's it. probably right. Yeah. I, I, I've only uh, seen him once in person. He has a kind of charisma that Donald Trump attempted to appropriate for his own style, a kind of a brawler, uh, uh, combative, ready to go to the mat for his country and for his party. And that is what's wearing thin. Is that the problem? People are tired of the fight? I think people are tired of many things around Netanyahu. You know, he doesn't keep his promises to, to partners in the coalition. Look, he didn't keep his promises to Benny Gantz, certainly. Uh, they see him as not uh, as not trustworthy. They see him as perhaps not uh, the question of poverty here, not quite honest. A uh, problem with his, uh, with his wife, uh, who people claim has, has too much control over decision-making. Uh, a lot of claims against Netanyahu. And, and again, it's just plain old BB fatigue. And uh, people like changes. We see that every midterm election in the United States, don't we? Yeah. Well, now, will Sarah Netanyahu's uh, illness play at all? Do, do Are the Israelis sentimental at all? She's been your first lady for 20 years. I know. And she likes calling herself first lady. Too. We actually, theoretically, we don't have a first lady. Um, and the prime minister is not the head of state like the American president. The prime minister is the head of government. The head of state is our president. We'll be living. Um there may be some sympathy for her. It depends how sick she is. Um, but again, she has her uh, her proponents and her adversaries and her detractors. And her detractors are, are many. But many people love her, too. Last bit of technical stuff. Israel goes dark before an election. That is, there are no ads allowed. There's no polling allowed. When does that deadline kick in? When do we stop getting data? About a week before, there's a last poll. And, uh, and it does go dark. Uh, I like it good thing from the polls um, and you have you know, we've had different polls with different outcomes um, my best guess again is that this is it is either a slim victory for Netanyahu or we go once again to the fifth round of, uh, of election oh my gosh 
Uh, so, Michael Oren, thank you for that primer. Uh, who is the most likely to be prime minister if it's not Netanyahu? It would either be Yair Lapid or Naftali Bennett. Um, and of those two, who is more uh, conscious of the threat from Iran? Because America cares most about that issue. I would say Naftali Bennett. I've talked to him extensively about it. Um, but I think Yair Lapid is, is, is no fool, and he understands this as well. And this is not an issue of left and right. It's an issue of Israel's fundamental national security. And on that issue, will any of these three do what is necessary to stop Iran from getting a nuclear weapon? We have no choice. With or without it's United States cooperation? I, I get it. I get it. But with or without United States, do, do either of those three recognize the United States having a veto over Israel acting against Iran in a strategic fashion? They cannot. And no longer than the United States had a veto of the United, over, over the creation of the State of Israel in 1948, that we tried, or um, taking out the Egyptian army in 1956, or, or, or launching a preemptive strike in 1957. But Israel overrode the American veto in every single case, because these were existential situations for us. We had no choice. And that will be the similar situation with Iran. You think we're getting close to that, Michael Oren? Well, it depends on how Iran acts. It depends on how the United States acts. Right now we see Iran escalating and America de-escalating. Uh, if the United States uh, begins to step up against Iran escalation, uh, we may be in a different situation. I hope we will be. Dr. Michael Oren, always a pleasure. Find his website at drmichaeloren.com. He's the guy to go to for, I think, very objective analysis of this. Although he might be back in the government, then we'll have to warn you about that. Michael, thank you for this long, extended My conversation. Pleasure. I appreciate it. Be well. Be well. Take care. Trending now on The Larry Elder Show. We're talking about the $1.9 trillion so-called COVID relief package. Very little of it has anything to do with COVID relief and how the left doesn't seem to think there are any adverse consequences. I got an idea. If there's no adverse consequences, why, pray tell, haven't we just had some big massive bill like this before and end poverty, end suffering, end child poverty right away? There are no downsides. Nobody has to pay anything. There's this tree in the backyard called the money tree, called federal dollars. Don't you love those euphemism? We need federal dollars. We need input from, we need federal backing. We need federal support. This model is not sustainable without federal input. Remember what Jonathan Gruber said about Romney care? He said the dirty little secret is that some smart people have figured out a way of ripping off the federal government to the tune of $400 million a year, quote, to make the thing work, close quote. That's what he said. That's what he said. I didn't say it. He said it. And they keep saying there are 15 million people living below the federally defined level of poverty. That's because they exclude the welfare benefits that they get. Don't even count housing benefits. And government has no money. As Milton Friedman brilliantly said, there are four ways of sending money. The most efficient is your own money on yourself. The second most efficient is your own money on somebody else you care about. The third way is when you have, for example, a business account, expense account. You can't go crazy, otherwise you get fired. Your boss will fire you. The least most efficient way, least productive way, is somebody else's money on somebody else. And that is this on steroids. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Eric Metaxas Show. You know, we, we talked about Cuomo. I want to stick on this. This is a guy who really does come across as high-handed. In other words, a lot of times people say that, but... Right now, what happened with the nursing homes, I mean, people are talking about the Me Too stuff. I think that's that pales in comparison to what he did with the nursing home uh, uh, business. When it came to the nursing homes, he did sign an executive order that said if somebody had coronavirus and they were in a hospital and they were to be returned to a long term.
Morning, glory in America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. Hour two of this Thursday edition of the Hugh Hewitt Show. I want to do part two of the rundown. Uh, as I uh, got off track in my long conversation, which will appear at the interview podcast with Michael Oren, uh, a primer on the Israeli elections and the stalemate that has developed over two years in Israel, that primer will appear at salempodcastnetwork.com or wherever the interview with Hugh Hewitt podcast is available. I do two podcasts every day. Uh, one is the, not every day, but most days. Every day I do the rundown. Uh, and two or three times a week I do the interview, which is an extended interview with one person about a matter of major importance. And if you go just Google the interview with Hugh Hewitt, Spotify, for example, you'll find it, you should subscribe to it, and you'll get the most important interviews that actually explain something you didn't know the Israeli election system is one of those things. That's why I took Michael Oren long in the last half hour. But the rundown part two here. Uh, facing pressure, Biden administration scrambles to shelter migrant children. This is in the uh, New York Times this morning. And in fact, the border crisis is real. It is metastasizing. It is getting larger every day. The facilities don't exist. It's worse than it was under Donald Trump at any time because Joe Biden and his team want illegal immigration. They do not want it to stop. They want it to continue. And that is because they're making a calculation. I heard it yesterday in my long seminar for Stanford students with Ron Brownstein, Ashley Parker, Lon He Chen, Ron Kane, and uh, Ben Ginsburg. Uh, Democrats do not want to close the border. It's a long game. I think they've made a mistake. It turns out in Florida, that the refugees of violence and the refugees of socialism turn into pretty good Republican voters. So that doesn't worry me. The fate of these children worries me. The fate of these young adults worries me. The fate of, uh, of America's reputation in the world because there is no way we can do other than release people. We're going to be so, we're going to be overwhelmed because you need to build a wall and you have to keep people in Mexico and then they stop coming. When you open the wall and you set, come on in and we'll waive everything and you can claim immunity and we'll teach you how to do it, they come. Who wouldn't? When you look at Honduras, you know, I'm in the middle of my Food for the Poor campaign. And I implore you to go to Food for the Poor uh, at the top of HughHewitt.com. The crisis in Honduras throughout all of Central America, but Food for the Poor is rushing relief to Honduras because... Natural disasters have piled on the COVID destruction, and we've got hundreds of thousands of children with not enough to eat. And when I say not enough to eat, most Americans think, oh, they're only getting one or two McDonald's a day. No, nothing to eat. Moreover, the violence level has gone off of the chart. Again, there's a cycle uh, that countries get caught in. Haiti's been caught in it before. Nicaragua's been caught in it. Honduras is caught in it now where the breakdown of relief and uh, the breakdown of economies lead to uh, survival instincts. And that means crime. You go get the food that your children need. Imagine being a father, we have one on tape, who can't see their children fed and who are aware of the violence in the street. Let's play that role. There are many neighborhoods and there are many uh, areas in the country which the gangs are the main problem with them, for them. And um, they are sometimes very afraid of uh, to be killed or to be robbed. It is a nightmare for parents in Honduras. One of the ways that that nightmare is alleviated is when food for the poor arrives and feeds a child. You can rescue a child for six months for $37. If you get to $100, you've fed a child for a year. And I mean real food. It's not uh, French cuisine. It's, it's not in and out burgers, it's rice and beans, but it, it will get you through the day, it will grow, you will not suffer the ill effects of malnutrition. And you can do that for them if you go to HughHewitt.com or you can call 855-359-HOPE. Wanna go back to the rundown. Guess who's in trouble again? By the way, my clock's broken, Wayne, I, I have to keep looking at this thing here, it's 4-11, uh, 7-11. Female aide said Cuomo aggressively groped her at the executive mansion. This is the sixth complaint. It's Governor Weinstein. Andrew Cuomo has become Governor Harvey Weinstein. Now, the rule with the Fetching Mrs. Hewitt and I is if there is one sexual impropriety, there may be two. Not necessarily, but there may be two. If there are two, that means there are 10. That means you've got a pattern. People don't assault women twice and then don't do it a third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth time. 
That means there's a pattern. And they have effectively created a network of fear that has protected them as Weinstein did, as Jeffrey Epstein did, and now as appears Andrew Cuomo did. And I don't think that's unfair based upon the record of allegations here. I think we have an Andrew Cuomo, Jeffrey Epstein, Harvey Weinstein kind of situation in Albany. And it's a Democrat problem. It's a Democrat state. There aren't any Republicans up there with power. They have to do what happened in Missouri. Eric Reitens was removed, was impeached by an overwhelmingly, or on the verge of impeachment when he resigned. I'm going to get Eric Reitens on to find out if that was a fair deal. But the Republican legislature was going to remove him. And now the Democratic legislature has to do the same thing. Back to the rundown. Secretary of State Blinken is going to take National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, go on his first tour. They're starting in Japan and South Korea, then back in Anchorage, they're going to meet with two Chinese officials. Meanwhile, Israel and the United States is going to have their first meeting in the United States. I think Biden is not going to be as bad for Israel as Obama was. President Obama didn't like Israel. He hated Benjamin Netanyahu. And I believe that we've got a chance. I think Biden is better than Obama, not as good as Trump. We will see. Bad news from Europe. This is from the Telegraph in the United Kingdom. Europe faces third wave as it lags behind with vaccination. The socialist countries of Europe, acting through a paralyzed government bureaucracy in Brussels, have managed to do what Israel, the United States, and Great Britain hasn't done, which is nothing. The United States invented two vaccines under Operation Warp Speed. Joe Biden's taking credit for it. It's not a Biden accomplishment, it's a Trump accomplishment. Boris Johnson got one vaccine up and running, the AstraZeneca. Now we've got three vaccines in the United States due to Operation Warp Speed. And we're rolling out vaccines across the United States at a million to two million a day. Great Britain is rolling forward with its vaccination. They're going to get herd immunity pretty soon. Israel already has herd immunity in the IDF. They're going to have herd immunity for the whole country soon. Europe is screwed because their governments are lumbering, socialist, ridiculous governments run by Brussels. And therefore, you get a headline from The Telegraph. A third wave of the coronavirus is sweeping across large areas of Europe, threatens to engulf many countries quicker than they can hope to vaccinate their citizens. South of our border, bad news. Mexico is set to legalize marijuana. Isn't that great news? Now the cartels are going to be able to grow legally what they will bring into the United States. It will be far more potent, far less regulated than the dope that is grown in the United States. Meanwhile, the royals remain a story in Great Britain. I'm not doing it anymore. There's a long story in the Financial Times on the symbiotic hatred between the royal family and the tabloid press. And it's kind of a deal with each other. They hate each other and they need each other. The royals understand they sign up to be covered intrusively and unfairly. And the tabloids agree not to campaign for the end of royalty because they sell newspapers. Meanwhile, Piers Morgan has put himself on the front page of every newspaper. I think, what is he, 55 years old? He's not the young darling of 25 years ago when he was editing newspaper. He's a blowhard. And he didn't work at CNN because the Americans said, that guy's a blowhard. And he tried to insert himself in the gun debate. And Americans said, go away. And he went away. Uh, that was an interesting part. I've done the Israeli elections. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Let me do a health story. There's something called long COVID. I don't know how prevalent it is. Nobody knows how prevalent it is. But in California, 32% of the long COVID patients began with an asymptomatic infection. I don't know what this means. I'm un unwilling to credit it yet. It's going to take a lot of deep studies. I fear, I fear that it exists. I also fear that a lot of people who don't have it are going to claim long-term disability based upon long COVID. Our legal system is not prepared for a long-acting virus. It just isn't. AMC, by the way, is reopening more theaters. When I can go to the movies again, the world is back. The, the country is reopened. When I can go to the movie, well, you know, I, I used to go to a movie or two movies a week. That's the joy of being a morning drive host. If you're done by noon everywhere in the United States, that means you go to the movies. The Justice Department has come in on behalf of college athletes in the case against the NC2A, hooray, hooray. And then my favorite story of the day, Trappist beer needs Trappist monks to brew it, but the vocation is dwindling. This is for Chad the Elder up in AM 1280, The Patriot. You really ought to give up everything, Chad, and go be a Trappist monk. 
Trappist breweries are facing a supply problem. They're running out of monks. They make the best beer in Europe, but there are not enough monks to make the beer. This matters a lot. St. Benedict's Abbey in Hamet Achel, Belgium, has relinquished the authentic label because they can't make it anymore. That's a tragedy. Your phone calls, America, 1-800-520-1234. Don't forget food for the poor. Please head over to HughHewitt.com. The banner's at the top. Be as generous as you can. Come right back to the Hugh Hewitt Show. This is Carol platt Lebow of Yankee Institute for townhall.com. Matt Meyer is president of the Berkeley Federation of Teachers, a union leading the effort to keep children at home, insisting that reopening schools is just too unsafe. So jaws dropped when video of him was seen taking his own daughter to in-person preschool. The episode highlights the hypocrisy and cynicism evident in too much COVID policy, especially in education. School districts with strong teachers unions are less likely to hold in-person classes. Meanwhile, our children remain trapped at home, suffering from social isolation and learning loss. The achievement gap has increased, and there's a worsening youth mental health crisis. Parents have stood by helplessly at the mercy of the unions, even as the CDC admits that schools can reopen safely. In-person learning shouldn't be reserved for children of the privileged. Our kids deserve policies that put their rightful needs over the self-serving demands of union elites. I'm Carol platt Lebow. The Pepperdine Graduate School of Public Policy, impacting policy decisions today, preparing public leaders for tomorrow. Learn more at publicpolicy.pepperdine. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Gorka. Who would you put in the Women's Hall of Fame? It's going to be somebody who's alive. Who would you put in there? Would you put... Somebody who'd battled the COVID virus. Somebody who'd been the face of that. Not doctor, I prefer to call her, call her Colonel Burks. Do you remember her? Scarf Lady! Would you put her in the Women's Hall of Fame? Or would you put an anonymous frontline health worker? Or somebody who helped develop one of the three vaccines from Operation Warp Speed, the fastest development in human history of a vaccine for a deadly international pandemic. Well, if those were your suggestions, you would be wrong. Uh, the National Women's Hall of Fame has chosen for this year, Dr. No, sorry, Michelle Obama for her massive contributions um, to, I don't know. Okay, enough of that story. What can we do? Can we do that? Can we do a Nancy? Let's do a Nancy. Oh, I like that. That is a good one. Let's keep that shadow. Like, that was a good sound. What an absurd decision. Her contribution to being angry? I don't know. Her contribution to being married to one of the laziest presidents in American history? Great. Give her a little statue. Give her a little plaque and an engraved name on some wall somewhere it's actually in seneca falls that's where they decide these things i'm sebastian gorka this is america first on the salem radio network michelle obama gets recognized as the amazing woman that she isn't keep up with what's trending subscribe on youtube today trending now on the charlie kirk show Oprah Winfrey, the fact that Oprah tolerated this whole conversation is so unbelievably disappointing. And I'll get to that. But first, I want to play this tape right here of Meghan Markle saying this, making the claim that there were racist remarks against her child's skin color. But she won't say who said it because she's doing maybe a Jussie Smollett thing. Play cut eight. And also concerns and conversations about how dark his skin might be when he's born. That yeah. was relayed to me from Harry. Those were conversations mm. that family had with him. If he were too brown, that that would be a problem. Are you saying that? I wasn't able to follow up with why, but that if that's the assumption you're making, I think that feels like a pretty safe one. Feels. Feels like a safe one. Megan, 
you are now allowing your feels, feelings, I guess I should say, to dictate an accusation of a family that largely, by all evidence available, embraced you. What an unbelievably ungrateful person you are. No gratitude. Perfect leftist. No gratitude. Keep up with what's... Welcome back, America. It's Hugh Hewitt. I am uh, going to post that long interview with Michael Oren at the interview with Hugh Hewitt. And it's available at Apple Podcasts, at Spotify, everywhere. Or you can go to SalemPodcastNetwork.com. I encourage you, if you get uh, half hour, 45 minute, one hour interviews and you like them. I listen to Orange and Brown, which is uh, the Cleveland.com podcast on the Browns occasionally. And drift off to sleep. I was doing it last night, Doug. Les Marys was talking about Baker Mayfield and the contract he's going to sign with Mary Kay and uh, others on the Orange and the Brown. But some people like to listen to podcasts when they work out. All of my podcasts at the interview with Hugh Hewitt are at least a half hour and some go as long as an hour. And they're the perfect companion. It's actually just a conversation with one person. So you can get a little depth. CJ Box whose uh, brand new Dark Sky debuted at number four on the New York Times. I, I think it's going to go to number one. Uh, Chuck's just an amazing author. I think it's going to go up there. But you gotta, you got to subscribe to not miss a single episode. And we'll put Michael Lauren up there. And I just tweeted out the interview link so you can go get it. Let me go to the uh, story of the day, business story of the day, brought to you by andrewandtodd.com. And it's interesting. It's one of those days where the story of the day is actually about andrewandtodd.com. Specifically, it's about their business. Two stories in the Wall Street Journal. The real rally to watch isn't in stocks, the journal's Mike Bird reports. The global real estate market is booming in a way that was confined to a handful of countries after the financial crisis. Economies will become more sensitive to house prices. Now, we're about to pump $2 trillion into the economy. It's a blue state bailout. Blue states were afraid they were going to struggle because people are fleeing California, for example. And their government employees were, were facing pension cutback. Well, they just got a massive handout in the blue state bailout. So all blue state real estate markets are going to go up. You can't put that much money into the economy and not see it rest and nest in some real estate markets. And they're out of control in places like uh, New York City is the only place where it's not out of control. But if you go to Northern Virginia, it is the wildest market ever. In, while, in Northern Virginia. I've been in and out of there since 1983. It's never been like this. Houses don't make the market. They get 20 houses, 20 offers on a house. There's nothing to buy in Maine. There's very little to buy in New Hampshire. Why that New York City fled. Atlanta's sizzling hot. Uh, and John Leahy in D.C. and uh, uh, Cousineau in uh, Atlanta. I've got realtors on the local stations. Call them up. Because you're never going to get a house if you're trying to wait for it to show up in the classified. It's not going to happen. You need a realtor. Second story that relates to Andrew and Todd.com. This one is right on target. Cash out refinancing hit highest level since 2008. Americans extracted more cash from homes through cash out refinancing in 2020 than in any year since the financial crisis. U.S. homeowners cashed out $152.7 billion in home equity last year. That's a 42% increase since 2019. Why did they do that? Two reasons. And one reason why you ought to go and do it yourself. The first reason is some of those people needed the money because their business has collapsed. If you're a real estate owner and you also ran a restaurant, guess how you have gotten through the last year? You borrowed the equity out of your home. That's what you did. And some of you are doing that right now with andrewandtodd.com. You're getting the loan that you need to survive. And by the way, this blue state bailout is not aimed at you. You'll get $1,400, but as a business owner, you know that, that that's a Band-Aid. It's not capital. You need to be recapitalized. You have to recapitalize through your home equity. The second reason to do it is to get money out of your house at these ridiculously low interest rates and put it in, and by the way, andrewandtodd.com, keep a list of financial advisors, put it into a good value and growth program 
so that it grows. Your interest rates will stay low. They're fixed. The interest rates are very low on refinancing. Get that money out. If you got to pay for college, you want to expand your house, you want to buy a second home while you can, an apartment or something, a duplex, now is the time to do that with andrewandtodd.com. They're great sponsors, but there are very few days where I find two stories, one in the Wall Street Journal, two in the Wall Street Journal about refinancing. Do your refinancing with andrewandtodd.com. Triple A, triple A, 1172, or go to andrewandtodd.com and answer a couple of questions. I'll be right back to you. Coming back with Congressman Mike Gallagher about the China trip, the China meeting that's coming up between Anthony Blink and Jake Sullivan and the CCP. Stay tuned. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you by Food for the Planet. Trending now on The Mike Gallagher Show. I just read the funniest article about Disney Plus that I think I've ever seen in my life. If this doesn't completely sum up where we are as a country in 2021, nothing does. Disney Plus is enormously successful. Um, everybody wanted to get it. Remember when Hamilton started streaming on Disney Plus and people ordered Disney Plus for that? Get all the Disney movies, all the classics, you know, Peter Pan, Swiss Family Robinson, all the things. And I'm a Disney guy. We all, my family and I, we're Disney people. Um, well, we can't watch necessarily Swiss Family Robinson, Peter Pan, Dumbo, the Aristocats. If we have children under seven, it's banned. Like uh, somebody over the New York Post called it, it's more like Disney minus. Listen to this. Um, Disney Plus has decided to go whole hog and drop a number of once beloved, now controversial movies from their children's menu. Children under seven are going to be forbidden from watching Dumbo, Peter Pan, Swiss Family Robinson, and the Aristocats. Settings on the app will prevent the movies from even showing up on the profiles of children under seven. Children under seven can't handle Dumbo. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. This is Carol platt Lebow of Yankee Institute for townhall.com. Matt Meyer is president of the Berkeley Federation of Teachers, a union leading the effort to keep children at home, insisting that reopening schools is just too unsafe. So jaws dropped when video of him was seen taking his own daughter to in-person preschool. The episode highlights the hypocrisy and cynicism evident in too much COVID policy, especially in education. School districts with strong teachers unions are less likely to hold in-person classes. Meanwhile, our children remain trapped at home, suffering from social isolation and learning loss. The achievement gap has increased, and there's a worsening youth mental health crisis. Parents have stood by helplessly at the mercy of the unions, even as the CDC admits that schools can reopen safely. In-person learning shouldn't be reserved for children of the privileged. Our kids deserve policies that put their rightful needs over the self-serving demands of union elites. I'm Carol platt Lebow. The Pepperdine Graduate School of Public Policy. Impacting policy decisions today. Preparing public leaders for tomorrow. Learn more at publicpolicy.pepperdine. Trending now on the Dennis Prager Show. I have a moral issue. I have a moral problem with people talking about the problems of their families to the world. Why, why don't others have this moral problem? Because the royal family is famous, so it's fun to peep in. The, the Oprah interview was voyeurism. That's all it was. Let's hear about how crappy your life is. 
Megan Markle's life, I, I can't tell you. When I think, the moment I hear about suffering, is a picture of Megan Markle in my mind. It's really worthy of a happiness hour subject. If she can be suicidal and crying incessantly, then it shows circumstances do not produce happiness or unhappiness. We produce unhappiness and unhappiness. The poor thing. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Larry Elder Show. Oh, one other thing about the uh, Harry and Meghan and Oprah thing before we leave that. Oprah's net worth, latest we could tell, 3.5 buh 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 billion. And here she is showing such concern for the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. I guess they still have the title or they take the title away. And I'm looking at what net worth says they've got right now plus the future earnings. Current net worth $50 million. I mean, you you can get by on that even out here in California. I know it's tough. If you budget, if you, you know, carpool. Okay, after their mom died, after Princess Diana died in 1990. Welcome back, America. It's Hugh Hewitt. Joined by Congressman Mike Gallagher from Wisconsin. Good morning, Congressman. How are you? Good, sir. How are you? Good. If uh, Senator Ron Johnson does not run for re-election, will you run for that seat? Well, Senator Ron Johnson is going to run for re-election, and so we're going to leave it at that, Hugh, and I'm encouraging him to do so, and he's our best chance to keep the seat. And this week, we are learning how painful it is when you do not have control of Congress to the tune of $2 trillion in a blue state bailout, a gift basket to liberal interest groups. I mean, this is the cost of losing elections. So conservatives, Republicans, we need to be tough. We need to be disciplined. We need to win elections. Otherwise, we are going to bankrupt our children's children and the federal government is going to keep printing money until we collapse as a country. This is dangerous, radical policy, and it needs to stop. Uh, I, I got to press you on this, though. Ron Johnson gave a, a Hamlet-like speech on running this week. So I thought, OK, he's not running. Are you convinced he's running? Uh, I hope he will run. Uh, I don't know. I don't confess um, to know where Ron stands today, but I sincerely, sincerely hope he will run again. We have a very late primary in Wisconsin, just on a practical level. We want to avoid any infighting within the party. Just given the stakes of retaking control of the Senate, we need to be focused on winning as a party. And if we're at war with ourselves, we're just going to help elect super progressive Democrats. We're going to keep passing bad policy. And so sincerely, I hope he will run again. So let me phrase it this way. I'll weigh on the plane on the third try. If he doesn't run, will you consider running? Hugh, I'm not going to make news on your program here today. Um, I am merely considering every time I come on your show what bad Packers joke you're going to make at my. No, I know every you know it gets old after a while, and so I just uh, but but I, I'm you're you're avoiding it by bringing it up. You won't even comment on if he comes out and says I'm not going. You're not going to tell me if you're going to go. Let me put it this way, Hugh. I you know I came into politics unexpectedly from a national security military background. I am thinking with my wife right now about where we can have the biggest impact in a short period of time. Um, I do not believe Congress should be a career. I'm a big fan of term limits. I want. I feel we have a narrow window as a country in order to get our act together, in order to defeat the Chinese Communist Party. And I'm not convinced we're doing that right now. So I am trying to figure out where I can have the biggest impact in that fight. So you're running for governor. Yo, I'm not running for anything. I just got reelected. I'm all right, all right. Next well, few years. You're not helping me out here. Let me bring up this story from the New York Times. 
Blinken will meet Chinese officials after Asia tour next week. They're going to go to Japan. Jake Sullivan and Secretary of State Blinken, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor. They're going to go to Japan and South Korea. Then they're going to meet with China. Why only three countries? Well, um, it just depends on what the constraints are for the trip. Uh, those are nah, wrong answer. Wrong answer. It's their Packers fans. They would not dare go for a fourth. I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. All the, the Senate talk was just to throw me off. My it was game. a setup. <laughs> oh, gosh. Dude. Every time. <laughs> That's five weeks in a row, Gallagher. Five weeks in a row, there's a fourth. There's a joke that sits there right there, and you run into it like Charlie Brown in the football. Five weeks in a row. You rattled me. I didn't want to make headlines this morning. Um, All right, so it's a real story. It's a real story. Tell me why these three countries and in that order. Well, on a serious note, uh, with Japan, I think we have a, a huge opportunity uh, on multiple fronts. Japan actually, interestingly enough, invested a few billion dollars in uh, onshoring, in selective decoupling from China in the midst of the pandemic because they realized the same thing we did, which is that we can't be critically dependent on a potential hostile foreign power for the production of various goods. So one opportunity is to talk to them about how that effort is going and where we can cooperate more closely. I'm co-chairing a task force on the Armed Services Committee with my colleague, Alyssa Slotkin, that is looking at supply chain vulnerabilities and this exact problem where we need to invest more domestically to make sure we're not dependent on China. So that's one thing we can talk with Japan, as well as how we can cooperate more closely on defense issues. When it comes to the conversation with China, however, I think we have some very important things that we need to communicate. One, if indeed uh, we realize that this latest Microsoft Exchange server leads back to Chinese actors, I think the administration needs to communicate directly and force- Would you explain what that is, Congressman? Because I know what it is, but the audience might not be up to date on the latest major security hack. Well, you know, in the wake of the uh, the hack of, of, of SolarWinds hack, which uh, we believe, uh, you know, can be traced back to the Russians. Now we learned that um, Microsoft Exchange servers were hacked. It happened domestically, but it may be linked to foreign actors. Uh, I should note that I have not been privy to any classified or sensitive briefings, so I'm just going off what's been reported publicly. But it would not surprise me to learn if ultimately it was hackers from China that were responsible for this. And so I think we need to look at them directly and say, you need to shut down all of your implants in American systems and users within the next 24 hours, or else there will be consequences, consequences as severe as we will be blocking all shipments of semiconductor manufacturing equipment, for example. I think the second thing we need to address head on, however uncomfortable it is, is the Olympics and the fact that the Olympics should not be happening in Beijing, given that this is a regime that's accused officially now by two administrations in a row of genocide. And the third thing I think we need to tell them is to have all your CCP apparatchiks, all the wolf warrior diplomats, diplomats to stop going around on American social media and spreading dangerous conspiracy theories such as that the U.S. Army is responsible for the outbreak of the virus. This stuff is still happening a year later, and we're not being aggressive enough in shutting it down. So that's just three short-term targets, not to mention all the things we need to talk to them about aggressive military moves in the South China Sea um, and all the ways in which we need to communicate that we are not going to be backing down from a more aggressive posture to the Chinese Communist Party. My sincere hope is that the Biden administration will build upon the success of the Trump administration when it comes to China, build off all the work that Ambassador O'Brien and Matt Pottinger and others did, not go back to the failed Obama strategy of trying to accommodate a regime that is intent on displacing us as the global preeminent power and discrediting our entire system of government in the process. The, uh, the news coverage of this foreign trip, Japan, South Korea, then Anchorage, with is being portrayed as the CCP coming hat in hand to meet with America. Uh, if they are doing that, that's because of the Trump policies that they want reversed. But I think we're actually putting too much emphasis on that. It doesn't matter where you meet. What matters is what you agree to do or not agree to do. Do you share that point of view? A hundred percent. And I, I think the other thing to communicate to them forcefully is that you know, notwithstanding the Biden administration's desire for cooperation on climate change, they are not going to 
surrender uh, on other issues that are just as, if not more important, particularly when it comes to defense issues, particularly when it comes to supporting our allies, and particularly when it comes to making sure that the Chinese aren't in a position to coerce us economically because of dominant positions they have in various technological industries. Now, uh, yesterday I did a two-hour class with your Nixon seminar colleague, Lon He Chen, Ron Brownstein, Ashley Parker, Ron Kane, and uh, Ben Ginsburg. And I tried repeatedly to inject China into the conversation as a difference between the parties. And it didn't take Mike Gallagher. And by that, I mean the other participants were not eager to engage on that. The students did not engage on that. And I remarked that the students all were born. They were born after the Berlin Wall came down. So they actually don't know about superpower competition. But do you think that issue has penetrated into the American consciousness yet, that they are an adversary and a dangerous one, or are we still blind to that? Uh, I do, per perhaps not as quickly uh, as it needs to, but look at the, uh, the Reagan Institute released a survey yesterday that sort of polled Americans' thoughts on foreign policy, and the perception of China as a threat has risen dramatically uh, over the last few years. And so I do think that Americans are starting to understand it. Now they come at it from different ways, right? If you're a manufacturer in the industrial Midwest and Northeast Wisconsin, you think about it primarily as an economic threat. You know, China is a competitor that cheats economically and is uh, responsible for the loss of millions of American jobs. If you're sort of a defense geek like me, you think about it primarily as a geopolitical and, and military threat. If you are a, um, a center left Democrat, perhaps you think about it as a, a human rights uh, violator and a, a threat to American values. So I think we have a lot of work to do in order to communicate why this is important to people that are just trying to live their lives in the Midwest. But I do think America is waking up. Is there a difference between the parties on how they approach the CCP? Yes, um, I think there, the biggest difference is an argument within the Democratic Party right now about climate change, which I referenced before. In other words, if you believe that climate change is the existential threat, then it naturally leads you into a more cooperative approach to China. If you believe instead that China itself, a state actor, is our existential long-term threat, then it leads you to a more competitive and adversarial relationship. Uh, within the Republican Party, I actually don't s sense such a division. There's a division on how robust our presence needs to be in the Middle East, particularly in Afghanistan. But on the China issue, I actually think the Republican Party is united in a very realistic, um, smart approach going forward. Now, I want to go back to the stimulus in the last minute that we have. It's a blue state bailout. Uh, New York, Mitch McConnell came out and said New York's budget problem is fixed. San Francisco's budget problem is fixed. And I don't mind that we didn't campaign hard. We were going to get rolled one way or the other. After Biden said, I'm just going to roll you, you know, we were going to get rolled. Has the party done enough to let people know how massive is the blue state bailout? I mean, there is an enormous inequity between San Francisco and, let's say, for example, Milwaukee. 100 percent in Milwaukee and, and, and more frugal cities in northeast Wisconsin are paying the bill to erase San Francisco's 650 million deficit. The short answer is no, Hugh. I think over the course of this entire year, because I do think we're going to have a, at least a couple quarters of robust economic growth because of pent sure. up demand. I'm feeling it on the ground in northeast Wisconsin. We are going to have to consistently point out how bad and irresponsible this bill is and who wins, right? The teachers unions who refused to teach while our kids were shut down and weren't able to go to school in person. And we have a rising rates of anxiety, depression and suicide. Government employees in our most liberal states and cities, New York infrastructure. It's a terrible bill and it completely undercuts all of Biden's campaign promises about unity, working together. Good old Joel is going to bring back the days of comedy in the Senate and Congress. I mean, that was a total lie. This bill is extremely radical. And mark my words, Hugh, when the $1,400 checks run out and are spent, they are going to argue for another round of direct cash payment to Americans. And also, they're going to simultaneously argue that we don't have a dollar to spare to increase the Defense Department's budget. After just spending $2 trillion, they're going to say we cannot maintain 3 to 5% real growth in the Defense Department's budget. That is a complete 
charade. It is a very tenuous argument, and we need to be aggressive over the next two years in exposing what really happened here. Now, the only way to explain it to an average American is saying, imagine your house poor, you're, you're stuck with a mortgage you can't pay. So you got yourself a bunch of credit cards, you max them out. You're going to have a good six months. And then the bills come and do. And when the Biden inflation arrives, it's going to hurt. Mike Gallagher, good to see you as always, Congressman. Remember the number four. I'm going to have to start putting something on to, to warn you a little bit. Five in a row with Mike Gallagher. Thank you, Congressman. Time for me to remind you not only of how easy it is to trick Mike Gallagher into falling for a Green Bay Packers joke, but to get your relief factor out and take it. I dip it in the first hour. I remind you about it two more times. $19.95. The only supplement I've taken in 30 years of broadcasting. I've been in this business for 30 years. Started in KFI in Los Angeles in 1990. Did 10 years of television, then moved into radio and television. And the only supplement I've ever endorsed, the only one I've ever taken, is relieffactor.com. Because I, look, I'm not denigrating anyone else's product. But I did the reading, I did the research, I talked to my doctor. These four natural supplements are four that you should take. So get started today at relieffactor.com. Come right back on The Hugh Hewitt Show. <laughs> I love when he's on Skype because then you can see it too when the penny drops. Um, yep. <laughs> no, I'm glad you did. I don't know if I can do it again. I've gotten it. Can we string together and play for them next week? All of them? Yeah, I mean, I think it's five in a row. Now on Michael Pack, this is also going to be an episode of the interview that when Harley, I don't think Harley's coming in today. I think he sent me a note saying he can't do it. Um, but when he gets back to it, the next one up will be Orrin, then we do Michael Pack. Yeah. Um, me tell him what to do? Yep.
Welcome, Welcome back, America. It's you. You are joined now by United States Senator Jim Talent, used to rep the, represent the great state of Missouri, and Senator Talent. Normally, we talk about national security and defense, but I, I need your uh, Mizzou expertise here. Uh, Roy Blunt retired or announced his retirement. That means there's a Senate seat open. Uh, Eric Schmidt, the Attorney General of Missouri, announced he's getting in. Uh, Ashcroft, the Secretary of State with the golden name, decided he's not. He's going to run for governor. And Eric Greitens is going to make a comeback bid. And maybe other people are going to get in. What's going on in Missouri, Senator? Well, uh, Missouri's become a pretty red state. Nobody can take it for granted. And we have a lot of very strong um, younger politicians, you know, particularly in statewide office, who are doing a great job and see an opportunity to serve in the United States Senate. I think it's a sign of health. Uh, I, I've never been one who doesn't like primaries. I'm going to do what I can, and everybody is going to to make sure they don't have a primary where they cut each other up. I don't think that's uh, good politics, and I don't think it's it's good for the state. Uh, and uh, we're going to pick a new senator, and um, and then we're going to elect them. And Eric okay. is great, and uh, we'll see who else gets in. I think there are several others who might. Which Erics? There are two Erics. That's right. I'm sorry. Eric Schmidt. Okay. Now— I, yeah. I am curious whether or not I'm glad, you think... I'm glad you clarified that. Yeah. I, I'm wondering, do you think Eric Greitens has a path back from the disgrace and the controversy? I've invited him on the show. I want to talk to him about it bluntly. It just seemed to me that if ever a political career was in ruins, it was his. Well, I mean, if anything can happen if we get a multi-way primary. I mean, I, I have a baseline concern about holding the seat. And, you know, uh, not accepting any more risk in that regard than we have to accept, as the intelligence community might say. So anything can happen if we get a lot of people in a primary. Um, I think we have a number of, of people who are known in the state but are also rising, as I said, who have a desire to serve and have a lot of experience and would do a great job and could get elected pretty easily. So I hope you know, you've got a Congresswoman and I'm blanking on her last name. Ann Wagner. Yes. Ann Wagner. Thank you. A former ambassador to Luxembourg. Is she viable as a statewide candidate? Oh, I think so. If she wanted to do it now, she has a, she has in a short time really amassed a great reputation on the house foreign affairs committee. Uh, I mean, she may choose not to do it um, for that reason. Um, she's a, uh, you know, she's a bulwark in the house, particularly on these foreign affairs issues. But yeah, I mean, I, Jason Smith from Southeast Missouri is a congressman who's very strong and I've heard his name noised around. Uh, so yeah, we have people in the delegation who could do it. Uh, I think I've always been a believer that, uh, that statewide officers, in a statewide race uh, have an advantage, in part because they're in Missouri <clears throat> during the campaign. They don't have to go to Washington half the time, right? <clears throat> well, Assuming former President Trump was uh, supported strongly by Jason Smith. I remember the last debate of the 2016 cycle. I was at Wash U in St. Louis, and the only elected rep in Missouri to show up with Trump was Congressman Smith. Uh, do you think President Trump will weigh in on his behalf as a result of that? Well, I, uh, I haven't talked to President Trump about it, uh, you know, you, and you, you, you can't ever be quite certain about what he's going to do. Uh, but I think everybody supported him, I mean, in the in the in the reelect. And uh, I and I, you know, the ones I talked to, it, they were enthusiastic about it. I mean, they were strong about it. So, I, you know, I the answer is I would I would think not because he has a lot of supporters across the party. And I think you probably be reserving his time and effort for places, you know, where there are people who opposed him. And if he wants to play that game, that's probably where he'll do it. So last question, what matters in Missouri right now, Jim? Tell we just spent $2 trillion. I don't know how much of that's going to Missouri. It's a red state. This is a blue state bailout. I don't know that Missouri get it's really quite tilted towards blue state. You think Missouri got screwed? I think the country got got I don't want to, don't know if I want to say screwed, but we just added two trillion dollars to the debt, spending on a whole lot of things that had nothing to do with the pandemic, and indeed money that can't even spent be spent until long after the pandemic is over. So, do I think Missourians are going to like that? No, I think what's as the details of this come out over the next couple of years, I think it's going to become unpopular. You know, I remember you, the stimulus of two thousand nine, the eight hundred billion dollars that was passed. And, you know, politically, by the time the 2012 campaign rolled around, and I was, you know, strongly with Romney at the time, 
Obama's team didn't even mention the word stimulus. I mean, it was so unpopular that they wanted to act like it put it in a memory hole, you know, like it had never happened. And I that's because I, you only yeah. find out what's after what's in it after right. it's passed. Right. Uh, exactly. Six hundred million dollars for San Francisco. It's a stunning bailout of one of the worst run cities in America. Right. And it's and there's going to be a lot that's going to come out about this. And, I, you know, I always have a baseline faith in the judgment of the American people. They should have passed a much small, smaller bill and they should have kept it in the context of, of, of COVID. And if they were going to spend that much, they should have spent it on things that provide a real investment to the future, like infrastructure and you like the national defense. Defense. Right? And not a dime for defense. Not a dime for defense. Senator Jim Talent, thank you. I appreciate it. Follow him on Twitter at Jim Talent with the Bipartisan Policy Center. I'll be right back, America. Hour three of the Thursday edition of the Hugh Hewitt Show. Straight ahead. Don't forget to sign up for The Universe. All of Hugh's broadcasts on demand, The After Show, which in my opinion is worth the price all by itself, Dwayne FM, and all sorts of bonus content. www.huniverse.com. Trending now on the Larry Elder Show. Oh, one other thing about the uh, Harry and Meghan and Oprah thing before we leave that. Oprah's net worth, latest we could tell, 3.5 buh 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 billion. And here she is showing such concern for the... Duke and Duchess of Sussex. I guess they still have the title or they take the title away. And I'm looking at what net worth says they've got right now plus the future earnings. Current net worth, $50 million. I mean, you, you can get by on that even out here in California. I know it's tough. If you budget, if you, you know, carpool. Okay, after their mom died, after Princess Diana died in 1997, uh, both Harry and William were left with $10 million after taxes. Also, he earned between $50,000 and $53,000 during his service with the British Air Army Corps. Meghan left with $2 million from Hollywood earnings after taxes, according to Forbes, also earning $80,000 a year for sponsorships and endorsement deals. They moved to Montecito, California, bought a $14.7 million mansion. That beats camping out. They did a deal with Spotify, three million, three-year deal for $15 to $18 million. And in 2020, they signed a $100 million deal with Netflix to produce content over five years. So I, I think they'll get by. I don't know. Maybe so. Hard to say. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Eric Metaxas Show. You are running to be mayor of New York City. And I have to say that even if we didn't have the worst mayor in the history of New York City uh, as the mayor, the Bla comrade de Blasio, um, I would, I would still think you would make a fantastic mayor. But the fact that this mayor that we have right now has taken New York backwards to David Dinkins era New York, which I see with my eyes because I live in this city, I was born in this city, it's unbelievable. So we desperately need somebody who understands New York, who understands basic principles. Um, but it's a big deal to run for mayor. You just made the announcement, what, a couple of weeks ago? As in fact, uh, on the day of the announcement, February 17th, it rocked the political world because, Eric, they assumed, oh, it's just a publicity stunt. Curtis won't walk away from his hosting job at WABC, a huge radio station, which you have to do because uh, immediately then you're in violation of FCC rules and local election rules in terms of equal time. So I understood all of that. So when I dropped the gauntlet and I said, I'm in it to win it, the whole nine yards, I got to save our city with the help of so many Republicans out there to win the primary and then go on to the general election. All of a sudden, people were like, wow, 
This is the crime fighter whose issue is number one in the minds of almost all New Yorkers because of how we have descended into the abyss. As you had mentioned, Eric, back to the bad old days of Fear City in the 70s when I first started the Guardian Angels 42 years ago. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. This is Carol platt Lebow of Yankee Institute for townhall.com. Matt Meyer is president of the Berkeley Federation of Teachers, a union leading the effort to keep children at home, insisting that reopening schools is just too unsafe. So jaws dropped when video of him was seen taking his own daughter to in-person preschool. The episode highlights the hypocrisy and cynicism evident in too much COVID policy, especially in education. School districts with strong teachers unions are less likely to hold in-person classes. Meanwhile, our children remain trapped at home, suffering from social isolation and learning loss. The achievement gap has increased, and there's a worsening youth mental health crisis. Parents have stood by helplessly at the mercy of the unions, even as the CDC admits that schools can reopen safely. In-person learning shouldn't be reserved for children of the privileged. Our kids deserve policies that put their rightful needs over the self-serving demands of union elites. I'm Carol platt Lebow. The Pepperdine Graduate School of Public Policy, impacting policy decisions today, preparing public leaders for tomorrow. Learn more at publicpolicy.pepperdine. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Burke. Disney Plus pulls iconic movies Dumbo, The Aristocats, and Peter Pan because they're racist. Now, I do believe it's 2021. Why were they not racist for the last 60 years, 70 years? How do they suddenly become racist today? The answer to that question is really to be found in everything we have discussed on this show for nigh on 26 months since we launched America First. If you think what you're witnessing today is the result of some crazy bartender from New York being elected to Congress or because Joe Biden is senile and can't answer any questions, has been hiding for eight weeks in the White House, no, it is a much, much larger story. Decades in the preparation, from our teacher training colleges, to the media, to film directors, filmmakers in Hollywood, to those who have crafted a narrative that everything that defines our civilization is to use their terminology, quote, problematic. Anything that dismantles concepts of objective truth is good. In fact, anybody who speaks of truth is oppressing somebody else. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. The Charlie Kirk Show. I kind of am obligated to get into this story right now, which is the story of Meghan Markle and Prince Harry. So I want to read this tweet here from Ben Means, an expert on the British monarchy. A lot of respect for the tradition and all of that. A lot of great friends in London and Great Britain. It's just not a primary concern of mine. And so I want to read from Ben Goldsmith's tweet, which I thought was terrific. The narrative being promoted by Meghan, friends of Meghan, and the leftist mainstream media and everyone else who hates the royal family and British traditions generally is that the royal couple were driven out of Britain because of snobbery and racism. This just isn't true. 
the British tabloid press and the British publicly initially adored the idea that a glamorous star from Suits was marrying into the royal family and got terribly excited by the novelty of their royal wedding in the chapel of Windsor Castle. They only started going off Meghan when they realized she was a pushy. Morning. Morning, Gloria America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. Hugh Hewitt on this Thursday edition of the Hugh Hewitt Show. A couple of issues I haven't covered yet this morning that I want to go to. One is the crisis at the border. First of all, is it a crisis? Roberta Jackson is the White House, air quotes, border czar. We don't really know what that means, but we know what she said yesterday. Cut number two. You know, I think the, I, I really, I'm not trying to be cute here, but I think the fact of the matter is we have to do what we do regardless of what anybody calls the situation. And the fact is, we are all focused on improving the situation, on changing to a more humane and efficient system. And, and whatever you call it wouldn't change what we're doing because we have urgency from the president on down to fix our system and make sure that we are better at dealing with the hopes and the dreams of these migrants in their home country. Okay, that's Pablum. Okay, that, that doesn't tell you anything about what's going on. She continued cut number two. Today we are announcing the restarting of the Central American Minors Program for children to be reunited with a parent who is legally in the United States. This program was ended abruptly by the previous administration, leaving around 3,000 children already approved for travel stranded. In phase two, we will be working to improve the CAM program to expand safe and legal avenues for, to the United States. I want to be clear, neither, in this, neither this announcement nor any of the other measures suggest that anyone, especially children and families with young children, should make the dangerous trip to try and enter the U.S. in an irregular fashion. The border is not open. Going forward, we will continue to look for ways to provide legal avenues in the region for people needing protection while we continue to enforce our laws. This is a process. We have a great deal to do, but this administration has made significant progress and we will continue to do so. It reflects who we are as Americans, putting our values at the center of our policy. Okay, that again is not problem. That is, come on in, I'll alley in free. Now, she put in there, the border is not open. But if, in fact, people get to come in, as they do now, through the declaration of a need for amnesty, which was not allowed under President Trump, they had to adjudicate amnesty claims from Mexico, that's an ali ali in free cry. And it does not matter how often you say the border is not open. If the border is open, people know. All right, people know. Cut number five, Jen Psaki on the border yesterday. You've been telling migrants from right there for a month now, all the way back to February 10th, that now is not the time to come, but they are coming in bigger numbers every day. So do you have a messaging problem? Well, I would say that in the last administration, we had a morality problem and uh, children were being pulled from the arms of their parents and kids were being set, uh, sent back on a treacherous journey. And that's not the approach of this administration. So certainly we understand that means there will be more kids who are crossing the border. We made a policy decision that that was the right humane step to take. But I think it's also important for people to understand that the vast majority of people who come to our border are turned away, are sent back uh, to their countries. What we're talking about here are unaccompanied children. And what our focus is on is ensuring that there are uh, safe places for these kids to go that have access where they have access to educational resources, health uh, and medical attention, uh, legal assistance as needed, and that we can expedite the vetting so that they can get to families and sponsors uh, where they can uh, have their cases adjudicated. I believe that this is going to be the defining issue of 2021. Although the COVID bill is huge and people are going to get checks, they're going to forget about those checks within three months because $1,400 is not enough to live on. Everyone knows that. It's a nice supplement. 
The child tax credit is an interesting program. The blue state bailout will stop the, uh, the collapse of public employee union uh, membership and enthusiasm because they are clearly getting sweetheart deals from the Biden administration. But you can't stop the pictures. You can't pretend it's not happening. Donald Trump stopped it, got it down to a manageable number. The wall was working. The messaging was working. People were not coming. The deal with Mexico was efficacious. That's all gone now. It's gone in eight weeks. And the result was predictable and tragic because more people are trying to make their way to the north on the false assumption that that border will always be open. And what's going to happen is blowback. Uh, Governor Abbott sent 500 National Guards to the border in Texas yesterday because it is becoming an obvious and overwhelming problem. And no matter how much the media is bent in the favor of Joe Biden, and it is bent significantly in the favor of Joe Biden, we do not have any nonpartisan media left. There is none left. Everybody has a point of view. They're either Republican or Democrat. And all the Democrat stations, which is 75 to 80 percent of the outlets, are not covering this the way they covered Donald Trump's border crisis and the kids in the cages thing. They don't want to know. They want to cover the $14 checks. But Americans know and they react. Now I want to go looking forward to 2024 when the bill comes due on the blue stop bailout and the open borders of the Biden administration. The Republicans are going to, in three years, less than three years, pick a nominee. Mike Pompeo was on Fox with Martha McCollum last night. He said this, cut number 11. Uh, it's pretty clear. I'm going to work to continue to build the conservative movement in the Republican Party. That same trip is going to take me to Texas on behalf of a candidate, to Omaha on behalf of a congressional candidate, and do party building work in Iowa. Uh, I've said all along I am up for the fight to continue to build out Republican success. 2022 will be an important election cycle. I aim to be an important part of making sure that we're successful at, in that election in November of 2022. And in 2024, if President Trump decided, former President Trump, not to run, <laughs> would you consider running? Oh, uh, it's it's way too early to tell. I, I'm very focused on what we're doing here in the near term. Uh, I'm always up for a good fight. I want to make sure that the ideas that I've been working on for a good part of my adult life are the ones that are advanced here in the United States of America, not those being proposed on the United States by this administration. You know, I think the secretary ought to just say yes. If he doesn't run, it's a sure yes. That's all he needs to say. And I guess he's afraid of the second question, which is, well, what if Trump runs? Will you run anyway? And he can't really answer that at this point because he doesn't know if President Trump is going to run. He doesn't know what it's going to look like in two years or what he's done in between two years or what's going on in the United States. But it seems to me, look, I think Senator Cotton, Governor DeSantis, Mike Pompeo are all running. I think Ted Cruz is running. Not sure about Josh Hawley. I believe Nikki Haley is going to run. I believe Christy Noem is going to run. I believe that we're going to find a half dozen others who are going to run. It's going to be wild. And they're all welcome here. It's Switzerland. Republican Switzerland is right here and they'll all come on. They'll all show up and then Governor Ducey is going to run. He's going to be here if he doesn't run for Senate. They're all going to look. This is the ski chalet of talk radio. I am the Ted Lasso of talk radio. Everyone is welcome here and everyone will be treated nice. Even Gavin Newsom, when the recall gets underway, uh, I, I email with Gavin Newsom. I think he's a nice man. I think he's fundamentally overwhelmed by the the state's many, many, many myriad problems, but he's a nice guy and I'll treat him with respect. He's the governor of the Golden State. Here he is at Dodger Stadium yesterday, uh, giving a less than optimistic view of what's ahead, cut number 13. You know, when this pandemic ends, and it will end soon, we're not gonna go back to normal. Because I think we all agree, normal was never good enough. You know, normal accepts inequity. That's why Latinos are dying from COVID at a higher rate than any other racial or ethnic group. And while essential workers' wages aren't enough for them to afford the essentials, and why mothers, mothers have been leaving the workforce in staggering numbers. Look, our eyes are, are wide open to what's wrong. And so our journey back must also be a path to close those inequities. There is no economic recovery, no economic recovery without economic justice. You know, I, I don't understand the staging. Yeah, yeah Dwayne, are you there? Did, did Dwayne come in today? You never know if it's Generalissimo is there. Yeah, I, yeah. Uh, you're there. Can we turn on the Dwayne cam? I'm here. Uh, what's going on in the Weather Center, by the way? Do we have the whiteboard for the Weather Center? <laughs> If people are watching on YouTube, which they should sure. be doing, they would get the full effect of that Gavin yes. Newsom clip. Okay, um, did you did did you see the Gavin Newsom clip? Yeah. 
How bad was the staging of an empty Dodger oh, Stadium? And, at- I was just out talking to the to the guys out here about it. Here is Gavin Newsom about ready to be recalled. Or, or potentially being recalled, and he's in front of an empty Dodger Stadium that is fully lit that taxpayers had to rent and pay for the electricity for, for the lights. And he's sitting there reminding everybody why you have no entertainment in California for the last year. I'm the reason right here why this stadium I'm in is empty. That that's what I thought, and I, I you know I would have gone to an office. I might have gone to a closed school and, and then, promised to reopen it. And then he says, "We're not going to go back to normal." I know. You know what it is? It is the worst political team in America. He wants Gavin to be Newsom recalled. Gavin Newsom has the worst political team in America. The worst polling, the worst fundraising, the worst advisors. The French Laundry Gang is what I call them. Uh, We'll be right back, America. Don't go anywhere. I'm in California for three more weeks, and I get to escape after my second dose. Stay tuned. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you by Food for the Poor. Trending now on the Mike Gallagher Show. For all of the hysteria of Trump haters for four years, ranting and raving about, Maybe you, got it for free. Are we sure they didn't get it for free? you know, mean Donald Trump and he's unconventional and he's not presidential. And do you think anybody worried about his mental competency? They didn't, you know, and yet about half the nation is worried that Joe Biden is physically and mentally not up to the job. Did you hear about the Rasmussen Reports survey that came out this week? 50% of Americans in the Rasmussen poll say they're not confident that Joe Biden is physically and mentally up to the job of being president of the United States. States. I just want to thank you both, and I want to thank the the, the uh, former general. I keep calling him general, but my my uh, the guy who runs that outfit over there. Uh, I want to make sure we thank the secretary for all he's done to try to implement what we've just talked about, and for recommending these two women for promotion. Thirty-four percent. Only thirty-four percent of the Rasmussen poll survey, 34% are very confident that he's up to the job. (laughs) Only third. So, you know, a third of Americans are very confident he's up to the job. Half say he's not, he's not physically and mentally up to it. 52% of likely voters are concerned that he hasn't held a press conference. He hasn't had a press conference yet. He has not had a solo press conference yet. You know why? Well, you know why. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. This is Carol platt Lebow of Yankee Institute for townhall.com. Matt Meyer is president of the Berkeley Federation of Teachers, a union leading the effort to keep children at home, insisting that reopening schools is just too unsafe. So jaws dropped when video of him was seen taking his own daughter to in-person preschool. The episode highlights the hypocrisy and cynicism evident in too much COVID policy, especially in education. School districts with strong teachers' unions are less likely to hold in-person classes. Meanwhile, our children remain trapped at home, suffering from social isolation and learning loss. The achievement gap has increased, and there is a worsening youth mental health crisis. Parents have stood by helplessly at the mercy of the unions, even as the CDC admits that schools can reopen safely. In-person learning shouldn't be reserved for children of the privileged. Our kids deserve policies that put their rightful needs over the self-serving demands of union elites. I'm Carol platt Lebow. The Pepperdine Graduate School of Public Policy. Impacting policy decisions today. Preparing public leaders for tomorrow. Learn more at publicpolicy.pepperdine. Trending now on The Dennis Prager Show. John, uh, we were talking about uh, H.R. 1, which is government takeover of state elections and how it skewed 
to, to keep the uh, Democrats in power. But while I have you, I feel like a guy who's ordering a second dessert. I would like to get a, a brief take on the $2 trillion bailout. Well, that may be the second worst piece of legislation I have seen in the last 40 years. Really? Uh, think. think about this. How many people do you know who have lost their jobs or at hours cut back and are struggling with their um, paying their bills? I bet you and I both know a lot. Of right? course, yes. Did you know that government workers, who, by the way, even if they've been working from home, um, haven't, you know, or at reduced hours, haven't suffered any cutback in pay, did you know that this bill includes a $20,000 leave? Well, Welcome back, America. Chew Hewitt. Uh, looking at the markets brought to you by Andrew and Todd.com. I told you last hour that two stories in the Wall Street Journal today are particularly interesting for a segment sponsored by Andrew and Todd. And I don't normally find one, much less two, that are about refinancing and real estate. But today in the Wall Street Journal, two stories. Cash out refinancing hit highest level since financial crisis. Millions of Americans. Uh, are taking money out of their home. They're refinancing. There are two reasons for that. They need the money because they're squeezed by the COVID or they simply want the interest rate to be lowered on their house. They definitely want to get out of an adjustable rate mortgage with the Biden inflation coming. And we're going to have inflation. There's no way to avoid it. In the history of the United States, we've never borrowed 10% of GDP in a non-war time to uh, simply give it away especially a blue state bailout to give it to public employees. It's, it's crazy. So there's going to be inflation. People need to lock in these low interest rates, which are low for a little bit longer. They started to rise or twice as high as they were uh, on the 10 year bond even six months ago. But home rates are still low. They're still in the twos in some places and the threes in most places. Go to Andrew and Todd dot com while you still have the time and get out of an adjustable mortgage. If you're in an adjustable mortgage, get out of it. Please listen to me. Don't take any money out. You don't have to. Put up with the pain in the neck refinancing, and it's not that much of a difficulty with Andrew and Todd. The second thing is the real rally to watch isn't in stocks. Now, there is going to be a real rally in stocks. It starts this week, and it's going to go, 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 because Americans of all sorts are going to get $1,400 check, and some families are going to get $5,000 checks. And if they kept working through the last year, what are they going to do with that? They're going to save it. Where are they going to save it? They're not going to save it in, under the mattress. They're going to put it in stocks. It's not enough to buy a house or a second home with. It is certainly enough to buy, go to Robinhood and get, you know, two shares of Amazon or five shares of Apple or 10 shares of it, whatever it is, to buy a no-brainer and get a little piece of the inflation-sensitive stock market. So it's going to be a big year, big year for the market and an even bigger year for real estate. So... Please get your home buying done or your home refinancing done with andrewandtodd.com. Overseas, it's all green. Japan up 0.6%. Hong Kong up 1.5%. England just above the line. Germany about 0.25% up. Crude is up to $65 a barrel. Gold is up to $17.32. Corn, I never report on corn. Who cares? I, I know I'm on in Nebraska. I know you care, but uh, you know it doesn't really matter in Atlanta. Uh, it doesn't. Well, Cleveland cares about their corn because they, uh, they don't have any pitchers who serve up a can of corn. That's an old baseball reference. I, uh, <clears throat> I would encourage all of you to go there. Let me also remind everyone, speaking about corn, there isn't any food in Honduras for the poorest of the poor. And that's between 10 and 20 percent of the entire country. And when we talk poor in Honduras, it's not like poor in the United States. There aren't food banks. There are churches that are overflowing with shelves. There are not a lot of relief organizations. There is food for the poor. And they've got hundreds of thousands of children who are hungry every minute of every day. And food for the poor is rushing aid there. They always pick the hardest hit country. Two years ago with Nicaragua because they had the volcano. 
Last year it was Haiti because they had the horrible storms that washed away the terrible crops. This year it's COVID devastated Honduras. And by COVID devastated, I mean the employment went to, to hell and back. They had a lot of American and British tourism, not anymore. Nobody's traveling. That entire service industry collapsed. On top of it, they've got a bad government and rising crime, terrible crime. Listen to one dad talking about what's going on in the streets. There are many neighborhoods and there are many areas in the country which the gangs are the main problem with them, for them. And um, they are sometimes very afraid of uh, to be killed or to be robbed. Even if you can get food down to Honduras, you have to be able to deliver it to people safely. And Food for the Poor has figured out how to do that. Please give them a call, 855-359-HOPE. 855-359-HOPE, or best, go over to HughHewitt.com and make the best gift that you can. Would you do it today? We're, we've already got thousands of you saying yes, but there are millions of you listening. I really wish, we're about to all get $14. Can you send $14 of your $1,400 payment? Some families are gonna get 5,000. Can you send 50? Because the need is great. People are starving to death in Honduras. Please help out. It's at HughHewitt.com. Trending now on the Eric Texas Show. Of Yankee Institute for Townhall.com. Matt Meyer is president of the Berkeley Federation of Teachers, a union leading the effort to keep children at home, insisting that reopening schools is just too unsafe. So jaws dropped when video of him was seen taking his own daughter to in person preschool. The episode highlights the hypocrisy and cynicism evident in too much COVID policy, especially in education. School districts with strong teachers' unions are less likely to hold in person classes. Meanwhile, our children remain trapped at home, suffering from social isolation and learning loss. The achievement gap has increased, and there is a worsening youth mental health crisis. Parents have stood by helplessly at the mercy of the unions, even as the CDC admits that schools can reopen safely. In-person learning shouldn't be reserved for children of the privileged. Our kids deserve policies that put their rightful needs over the self-serving demands of union elites. I'm Carol platt Lebow. The Pepperdine Graduate School of Public Policy, impacting policy decisions today, preparing public leaders for tomorrow. Learn more at publicpolicy.pepperdine. Trending now on the Dennis Prager Show. John, uh, we were talking about uh, HR1, which is government takeover of state elections and how it's skewed to, to keep the... Uh, Democrats in power. But while I have you, I feel like a guy who's ordering a second dessert. I would like to get a, a brief take on the $2 trillion bailout. Well, that may be the second worst piece of legislation <laughs> I have seen in the last 40 years. I really uh, think. Think about this. How many people do you know who have lost their jobs or had hours cut back and are struggling with their um, paying their bills? I bet you and I both know a lot. Of right? course, yes. Did you know that government workers, who, by the way, even if they've been working from home, um, haven't, you know, or under reduced hours, haven't suffered any cutback in pay, did you know that this bill includes? a $20,000 leave benefit because they've been on leave at home for federal workers? No, I did not know that. $20,000. Now, private sector workers aren't eligible for that. Right. Just That's government it. workers the, for the it, it, This is the seal of the corruption. The ba I'll tell you what gets me. The bailing out of Democratic uh, governors and mayors of the gigantic, irresponsible debts that they have created, and now they will be paid in paper money manufactured by the government. 
Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Larry Elder Show. We're talking about the $1.9 trillion so-called COVID relief package. Very little of it has anything to do with COVID relief and how the left doesn't seem to think there are any adverse consequences. I got an idea. If there's no adverse consequences, why, pray tell, haven't we just had some big massive bill like this before and end poverty, end suffering, end child poverty right away? There are no downsides. Nobody has to pay anything. There's this tree in the backyard called the money tree, called federal dollars. Don't you love those euphemism? We need federal dollars. We need input from, we need federal backing. We need federal support. This model is not sustainable without federal input. Remember what Jonathan Gruber said about <clears throat> Romney Care? He said the dirty little secret is that some smart people have figured out a way of ripping off the federal government to the tune of $400 million a year, quote, to make the thing work, close quote. That's what he said. That's what he said. I didn't say it. He said it. And they keep saying there are 15 million people living below the federally defined level of poverty. That's because they exclude the welfare benefits that they get. Don't even count housing benefits. And government has no money. As Milton Friedman brilliantly said, there are four ways of sending money. The most efficient is your own money on yourself. The second most efficient is your own money on somebody else you care about. The third way is when you have, for example, a business account, expense account. You can't go crazy, otherwise you'll get fired. Your boss will fire you. The least, most efficient way, least productive way, is somebody else's money on somebody else. And that is this on steroids. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Eric Metaxas Show. Welcome back, America. Chew Hewitt, conservative documentarian and excellent documentarian. Michael Pack has a long record of extraordinarily impressive films. That's why President Trump asked him to lead the U.S. Agency for Global Media. After a long political battle, he was confirmed and he went to the agency and he began to make long overdue changes to return it to its original mission. And as a result, there was great controversy. And the day that President Biden took office, indeed, the first official action on the personnel side, he fired Michael Pack, <laughs> which is his right. But he did it because Michael Pack was getting the job done. Not long thereafter, Amazon acted to cancel Michael Pack's film on Justice Clarence Thomas. This is an underreported story, but I asked Michael Pack to join me today to discuss it at length. Good morning, Michael. Welcome back to the Hugh Hewitt Show. Thank you. Good to be here, Hugh. Uh, Michael, I met you once at the offices of Hillsdale College, and but I followed your work for a long time. Let's begin from the baseline assumption that people don't know your work. Would you give them a, a quick summary of your career and your films? Sure. I've been making documentaries for many decades. Uh, I founded my company, Manifold Productions, in 1977, and we've made over 15 films. Uh, all nationally broadcast on public television, one on TLC. And they've been on a variety of subjects, history, culture, politics. We did two on founding fathers, one on George Washington, one on Alexander Hamilton with Richard Brookheiser. Uh, we recently did a film before the one you just mentioned on Admiral Rick Ever, who built the first nuclear submarine. Um, we've done ones on controversial subjects like Rodney King, which I think is more relevant now than when we did it, you know, 10 years after it was ha after it happened. So we've done uh, lots and lots of documentaries, you know, plus I've served in government a few times. Uh, I was previously in international broadcasting under George H.W. Bush, and I was on the Council of the National Endowment for the Humanities under George W. Bush. And I served as senior vice president at the Corporation for Public Broadcasting in charge of television programming. 
So you've got this great resume, and I want people to understand we have these obscure agencies. Both Michael and I are veterans of NEH, National Endowment for the Humanities. I was its general counsel under acting director John Agresto and then under Lynn Cheney. These little tiny agencies don't have a lot of money, but they have an enormous amount of influence among tastemakers. Explain the U.S. Agency for Global Media, Michael, because people won't recognize it by that name. Uh, I think that's exactly right, Hugh, but it is very important. Uh, it is really an umbrella organization that has the five government international broadcasters within it. That's the Voice of America, the Office of Cuba Broadcasting, the Radio Free Asia, Middle East Broadcasting Networks, um, and Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty. A and together, they reach an estimated audience weekly of 350 million people, a huge number. They broadcast in 70 languages all over the world. The budget is about 850 million a year, not a lot by government standards, but it still makes it one of the biggest media organizations in the world. And it's very powerful and it, and it has a, a very important mission, I think more important now than ever before, which is why I, I did respond to the request that I run this agency. Its mission is to tell America's story to the world and promote American ideals like democracy and freedom. And, we, and those ideals are very much under attack, especially from China, but from North Korea and Iran and many of our adversaries. They are promoting their very different values and principles, and we need to defend our own. And that is the mission of this agency, and it is truly important. Now, uh, people of our age will remember the Cold War, and they will remember Radio Free Europe. And the important part it played and keeping hope alive behind the Iron Curtain. There is now a role for that sort of uh, an agency, especially in Asia, but also in other authoritarian and tyrannical parts of the world. So when you arrived there, first of all, you had been delayed a long time. Why was your confirmation delayed? I was, I, the White House asked me to serve in March of 2017, and I didn't really walk through the door of USAGM until three years and three months later. As you know, presidents are, have a four-year term, so three years and three months is a long delay. From the moment the White House asked me to serve in this position, the media launched an attack. I was going to turn into Trump TV. Uh, you know, I was going to politicize this wonderful agency. So the media, which had paid little attention to this agency for many decades, suddenly found it important. Um, and I, I think the key is something that you alluded to earlier, I think, Hugh, and that is that progressives, the left, recognize that media organizations are hugely important and they wanted to defend this one, whereas Republicans were willing to trade it off for anything else. They didn't consider it important, but the Democrats who wanted to stop me did, and they don't, do not feel that they should give up control of media and communications organizations. Now, I believe that Leader McConnell is the most effective Republican leader that the Republicans have had since, well, as long as I've been alive. But he had to make you a priority to finally get it done. Of course, judges matter more because they're lifetime appointments, and he always put judges first. Did any Republican put a hold on you, or was it just a matter of the Chuck Schumer slow walk on all nominations? Well, you know, in, I'm, my position has to be confirmed by the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And in the beginning, it was uh, chaired by Senator Corker, who was no friend of President oh, Trump's. Sure. So he worked hand in glove with the, with the ranking member, Senator Menendez, to block my nomination. And after Corker left, Senator Menendez continued to do that. And it was really not un let, until President Trump personally intervened that the that log jam broke. I, I do not believe the president of the United States should intervene at a, this level of um, nomination, but he did. He called Senator McConnell. He spoke to the Republicans on the Hill. You know, he made several calls on my behalf. And without that, I think they would have delayed me way into the Biden administration. Yeah, you've just reminded me. Senator Corker did so much damage as a, uh, I don't use the term rhino, but he was just simply confused about what government is and how it's supposed to operate. And he, he turned the Constitution upside down on the joint powers agreement with Iran. So I'm not surprised he screwed up this as well. When you got there, Michael Pack, what did you do that caused such cries of anguish from tenured bureaucrats? It was, I could hear the screams in Alexandria. Well, you know, my only goal was to return them to their core mission, which is to tell America's story and also to report the objective news in a balanced, fair way. That's not only their mission, it's the law. They're legally required to do that. But right away, they, they fought. They fought against that. And they, the first thing I did is I wanted to 
get rid of the heads of the existing networks and then finally bring in my own, a very standard practice that was considered, oh, you know, bloodletting, even though there are 4,000 people in this agency, four of them, five of them were, you know, pushed out. And, you know, it was political right from the start. And then we tried to look at the programming in terms of balance and bias. And we tried to make sure that a period of long, gross mismanagement was reversed. And all that just had cries of, um, uh, of opposition. And they were supported very strongly by the media, by friends on the Hill, and they launched numerous uh, lawsuits against us. Yep. Yeah, Michael, there is a club of media elites, just like there's a club for growth. There's a club of media elites and it is both government and non-government. And so you've got the Manhattan Beltway media elites and then you have the NEH, the NEA, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, NPR and this agency that you took over. And if we did a Venn diagram of where they overlap and how people move between them, it really is an organism. And you were attacking one part of that organism that they don't want to give up the way that Bill Bennett did in the first term of Ronald Reagan. I think they were afraid of that. Were they right to be afraid of that? Well, I don't know. It depends. I mean, I was going to bring it back to its core mission. If that's horrible, then they should have been afraid. I think a good example of what you said, Hugh, is that one of my predecessors, I was really the first Senate confirmed CEO, but he was an appointed CEO, Is John was John Lansing. And he left being CEO of USAGM to become president of NPR, you know, just indicating that same how closely connected these organizations are. And not surprisingly, NPR was perhaps the most aggressive in doing negative stories about me. Yeah, and NPR is actually seamless with the big major networks. People go back and forth all the time. I've worked inside of NBC with CNN. I've been on all, there's just a, seam, a membrane that allows the left-wing point of view of elite media to flow back and forth between NPR, the CPB, and the other influencers. But we always thought that Voice of America and its allied agencies were immune from that. You discovered they were not. Well, that's right. And I, you know, I think because there was no actual Senate confirmed CEO for a long time, there was gross mismanagement. We found this huge security failure, which I think is a story in itself. But I think maybe more interesting to your viewers are the examples of bias that we found. I mean, for example, the worst case perhaps was a video by the Urdu service, which is supposed to be targeting Pakistan, obviously. But this was really a repackaged Biden ad that appealed to the voters, especially in Michigan, the Muslims in Michigan, to flip the state for Biden. It had Ilan Omar, it had AOC, it had everybody appealing for people to vote, and it had Biden, you know, quoting the Prophet Muhammad. And there was no, nothing on the other side. I mean, it was a flat out ad. And it had, well, it, on, it, it reminds me of when Lynn Cheney arrived at the uh, NEH in 1985 or six, the Africans was coming out and the Africans was nothing but a 10 part diatribe against America. And so she, she couldn't defund it, but she pulled the name off of it and she got as much heat as you did, but she had stronger allies and the president backed her up. The president left, you were hung out to dry. In fact, are you not the first person who was fired by the president? I've, I, Politico reported my being fired as his first foreign policy move. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I was at, at 1220. I got a notice that if I didn't resign a, as of 2 p.m., I would be fired. So 1220, I mean, 2, 12, noon, 12, 20 minutes after noon, 20 minutes after the uh, swearing in, I was fired, essentially. So, yes, I, read I was that. either first, I'm either first or close to first. And, I want to ask if you've got any, did you get anything done in that hour and 40 minutes between the receipt of your notice? Did, did you do anything that we can remember from that hour and 40 minutes? I was at least able to write a farewell to the staff and what I felt and why I thought this was a big mistake by, by then President Biden. So I don't know. I mean, and then right. he fired everybody I had appointed and brought back people who are under investigation for gross mismanagement. I mean, within a week, you know, everybody I had brought in was gone, including people with two year contracts with people who had been appointed by boards, all fired, all gone. And none of that got negative attention, unlike my own efforts to make any kind of reform. I'm not surprised because again, we're talking about the blob. 
And this is the Manhattan Beltway Media Elite. And what you were taking over was a part of the blob. It's a little known part of the blob, but it's part of the blob. Now, Michael, I think in 2024, every Republican candidate is going to use your name in their stump speech. They're going to say, we're going to send Michael Pack back to finish the job. And they're going to, because it is actually a proxy for the culture war. And by culture war, I don't mean violence. I mean the argument about what America stands for, how it is represented to the world. And I think you are a proxy for that entire argument. So Michael Pack will be, do you mind that role that's ahead for you? I, I do not mind. I, I was looking forward to another four years to try to fix this agency because I think it's important. I do think it is really, really hard. I mean, may, I have a, I know Lynn Cheney and I have huge respect for her, but things have gotten so much worse than when she was at the NEH. Yeah. I mean, one thing I found really, Hugh, is how hard, it, why do these people fight back inside the Voice of America, for instance? Because what do they, who do they look up to? Who do they admire? They want to be like CNN. They want to be like the Washington Post. They, unlike the Washington Post, they're required to be objective, to be balanced, to reflect the views of all the American people. But when they think of good journalism, they think of the Washington Post and CNN. So my effort to make them more objective and balanced than CNN struck them as excessive. And it always will. It's so I hard have to change the culture. I am a columnist for the Washington Post, and I will credit the Post <laughs> at least with giving me a little plot of ground on which I get to write without fear or favor, and like I have liberals on this show and I invite them to say whatever they want. But that is not the culture of the government agencies. And in fact, when I was at NEH, I was astonished by the bias. And it's not as bad as NEA. And it sounds like NEA isn't as bad as the U.S. Agency for Global Media. And nobody's as bad as NPR. NPR is absolutely the worst, most biased government organ in America. And I hope someone can, it would really resonate with Americans if they defund NPR. Michael, now I want to talk about what happened to you since you left. Because we live in a democracy. They won. They get to fire our people and start over. I have no objection to the use of authority to, to uh, fire you. I think it was improvident, but it's not unconstitutional. I am worried about what happened to Justice Thomas in, in his own words, one of your most recent films. First, tell us about the film, then tell us what happened to it. Well, it's a two-hour documentary called, as you say, Created Equal, Justice Thomas in His Own Words. And it was in movie theaters uh, early in 2020 until they finally closed. And we did really well. We were in 110 theaters. We got many good reviews. It was broadcast nationally on PBS in May or June, I forget which, to, to, to again, uh, great reviews. And it was you know, very, you know, PBS loved it and they did well by it. And then we then we released it digitally in in the fall. And I, I should say the film is really allows Justice Thomas to speak. I was privileged to have 30 hours to interview him over six months, and he told his entire life story. He looks directly at the camera, tells viewers what his life was like as he experienced it. And he's the only interview, along with a little bit of his wife, Jenny. So you hear his version of his life story, and the viewers get to decide whether they like him, whether they agree with him. I mean, of course, there's archival footage and recreations and stills and many other things, but it's basically Clarence Thomas telling his story. And as I think the most important African-American alive today, it's worth hearing his story. So it was released digitally in the fall and Amazon was one of the platforms it was released on and it was offered in a, in a buy rent uh, button, plus you could buy DVDs and then it went on Prime. So we were shocked on February 8th at the beginning of Black History Month when Amazon kicked it off. It was no longer on Prime. You could no longer buy or rent it. DVDs were technically being sold, but they were out of stock and they were not asking for more from our distributor. So everyone was shocked. I mean, why would you deplatform, you know, cancel Clarence Thomas and Black History Month? Our distributor Let me ask, is, is there a benign explanation, Michael, for what happened? I think there's, it could have been an oversight. It could have been anything. But so that's what happened on February 8th. But then I wonder why they haven't put it back. My distributor has asked. Numerous people in the media have, have asked. There was a piece in the Wall Street Journal by Jason Riley and the Wall Street Journal asked. So why not put it back? I mean, even if there was a good explanation. Um, I don't, I can't understand it. Why are they not even requesting DVDs, which they're supposed to be selling? 
So I don't know. I mean, they have said nothing to me. I, I think it is too bad. People can still see the film. If they go to our website, manifoldproductions.com, and look up the film, you can see where it is streaming, and it's streaming in a bunch of places, including YouTube and iTunes. And you could buy DVDs from the website, although we're way backed up since Amazon isn't selling it. Um, I, I hope, by the way, that people, I hope you contact SalemNow.com and get it over there. I have not seen it, but I did interview Clarence Thomas when the Justice's autobiography came out, I Am My Grandfather's Son, which I think is one of the most moving autobiographies I've read. I spent two hours talking to him about it. He has that wonderful mellifluous voice. You must have been seduced by the voice, Michael, right? <laughs> Well, that's right. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I thought he was it would be great to hand over the film more or less to him to tell his stories. He has a great voice and he is a great storyteller, as you know, from having had that long interview. And he has a really powerful life story. I mean, on, on, on many, many levels. I mean, on the simplest level, as you know, he grew up in the segregated South. I mean, he was born in Pinpoint, a Gullah speaking area on the coast. Then his mother moved him to Savannah where he experienced real poverty, not enough to eat, cold in the winter. She would bring him to school and he'd just leave school and wander the streets. You know, real poverty and it was, and real segregation. The Ku Klux Klan was still marching in Savannah every year in those days. So he, he went from that to the Supreme Court. It's a great American story, a Horatio Alger story, with lots of twists and turns. I mean, he was finally, his mother brought him to his grandfather to, to raise, as, as you could tell from the title of that book. And he, he had really solid values, biblical values, as he put it. And he taught Clarence Thomas the value of hard work and going to school. He insisted that he go every day to a Catholic school. His grandfather was Catholic, an unusual thing for an African-American in those years. And the nuns too gave him these, these core values. And then he rejected those values in the 60s. He, he was going to be a priest. He studied for the priesthood. He was in a seminary. And, and after experience racism in the seminary and, the, and the, what it was like in the 60s, he became a radical. He was a supporter of the Panthers. And so then it's a journey back from that. So it's a complicated and powerful life story. And his stories at Holy Cross and Yale are fixed in my memory, but mostly his grandfather is fixed in my memory because he helped deliver with his grandfather in an unheated truck every morning at the same time. That's right. It is genuinely an inspiring story, but the left can't let that story be told because it's counter the narrative, right? And so, Michael Pack, what, what do you expect will happen in this culture war? We got about eight minutes left. I, I want to know where you think it's going and I want to know what you're going to do next besides working to put uh, Justice Thomas's film back on Amazon, which I hope they're listening. I hope Jeff Bezos is listening because it makes no economic sense. There's controversy. They'll sell more of it. But why? Where do you think we're going with this culture war? What are you going to do with it? I have never been more concerned about anything than this culture war, and especially this sort of cancel culture. The assault on me, the attempt to sort of erase me and make it impossible for me to work, and these court cases against me, and this vast amount of press, and, and now even canceling Justice Thomas. I, I think we're going into a really scary moment. I mean, one thing I'm doing is starting a, a free speech foundation to defend the people who have been canceled. Uh, I'm going back to producing documentaries and, and feature films that tell the true story of America. Uh, I, I feel strongly that we are not telling America's story, not to the world and not even to ourselves. That has always been part of my goal through my films and through, through Manifold Productions. I, I'm, my wife and I are partners in this company and that has always been our goal, but it's, it's more important now than ever. We need to explain America and American principles, especially to our youth, but to the world as well. I mean, what America stands for and why it is a noble principle place and why people should sort of come here and, and if not, try to um, uh, understand those principles and apply them where they are. I mean, it's very important to do. I'm going to do it through the production of content, but I want to really do more to, to sort of win this fight. I mean, I feel strongly, Hugh, that I've been engaged in this for my entire career and we are losing and it gets worse. We even are losing many uh, great books and many conferences and even good films. We are not winning. And we no, we're losing. Mistake. We're losing. And, and we lose because 80 percent of the uh, territory is occupied by our adversary, not our enemy, our adversary. Uh, a couple of very quick exit questions. Uh, I'm sure Bruce Hershenson was your friend. He was my friend. And Bruce used to talk about 
how VOA made such a difference. And we need that back as well. Not only do we have to win the war for freedom in the United States, by that I mean we have to return to being a liberty people, we do have to worry about the CCP. They are, they never rest, they never stop, they are always abroad, they are always penetrating, and we need an active global presence. But we also need to talk about how to win. I am curious, my one suggestion, have you ever made a film about Rush? No, I haven't. I think that's a good suggestion. I mean, this is obviously the time. It, it is. And I think I never met him, by the way. I'm not his friend. I only talked to him on the phone and emailed with him. I'm not his friend, but I believe he stood for a particular sort of voice. And his doggedness is really what the right needs right now. This, the, it's the doggedness of Hillsdale. It's the doggedness of Rush Limbaugh. And I think his legacy is being distorted because of bad media. Mm. And it would take a narrative film to actually tell it the right way. I think that's a good point. I mean, he and, and Hillsdale are, are one of the few examples of victories of ours in the culture war. And in Russia's case, when he started, it was really hard. People don't remember that, but he was a lone voice for a while. And I think you're right. You know, the left, in, even in his obituaries, the left chooses to air every single controversy about him. I have a friend who likes to point out that obituaries of uh, conservatives always mention their controversies as well as their achievements, whereas obituaries of people, progressive people, ignore all their controversies and anything scandal that might have um, once been attached to them as you know not in good, you know not cor correct, you know, not not 